Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll now uh, proceed with the uh, next uh, round of presentations, the afternoon round. Our first presenter is uh, Casey Edge, Victoria, Re Victoria Residential Builders Association. Uh, Casey, you have uh, five minutes. Uh, there should be a light at the front of this desk. Uh, it will turn green when you have two minutes left. We'll signal you uh, when you have 30 seconds left so you know to wrap up. And the red light means your five minutes is up and then we'll open it up to questions for the member from the members for another roughly five minutes. Okay, thank you. So whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. My name is Casey Edge, Executive Director of the Victoria Residential Builders Association, a nonprofit promote, promoting professionalism, consumer protection, housing and aff housing affordability. We have 190 members, of which the majority are contractors on Vancouver Island. The time has come to admit that the long-standing provincial policy of municipal self-determination has failed an entire generation of millennials trying to purchase a home. All kinds of mythical explanations for rising prices have been used and demand side taxes implemented, all to no effect. We continue to experience historic lows of housing inventory and prices continue to spiral upward. The recent uh, update by BC's Ministry of Finance reports the property transfer tax revenue is up $360 million due to, and I quote, higher prices and limited inventory. The increased revenue may be a plus for the government, but it's all on the mortgages of a shrinking number of young families able to afford a home in British Columbia. The reason for short supply is population growth from a large demographic of millennials starting families and a 55% increase in immigration in recent years. Most new Canadians settle in BC and Ontario and we have an obligation to welcome them with reasonably affordable housing. That's not going to happen without responsible regional planning, which does not exist under a governance structure of municipal self-determination. CRD's claims of a regional growth, um, housing of regional growth and housing strategies are also a myth in an environment of 13 official community plans. Recent mandatory housing needs reports reveal local obstruction, including Machosen with zero purpose-built rentals. Nonprofits report they avoid Oak Bay when developing their affordable housing projects. It is simply not credible to defend municipal self-determination when a core municipality like Oak Bay is able to deem duplex zoning and secondary suites illegal in a housing crisis, especially considering the municipality shares a border with the University of Victoria. We've had several, we've, we have had a federal election, we've had federal election candidates promise to spend billions of taxpayers' dollars to build government housing, while 200 development applications gather dust in the district of Saanich. At a rate of 14 reviewed annually by council, it will take 14 years to get through the, the existing applications. As we speak, the district of North Saanich has an influential and vocal anti-development group, some past members of council opposing even a review of their official community plan. This did not happen overnight. BC governments of every political stripe have supported the policy of municipal self-determination and therefore under undermined responsible regional planning. This is despite the warning in David Foote's book, Boom, Bust and Echo, over 20 years ago that a demographic wave was coming. The only solution for boosting housing supply and affordability is mandatory regional planning and prioritizing housing over municipal autonomy. This is necessary for infrastructure such as transportation, sewer and water and also true for housing. In 1974, long before the awareness of climate change, Edmonton in the heart of oil and gas country started their LRT with a population similar to Victoria's today. Yet with, with the knowledge of climate change, the BC government and CRD municipalities have not come together to develop a single regional plan for housing and LRT to reduce West Shore traffic. Over the past several years, it has become very clear we can have either more housing affordability and responsible infrastructure development, or we can have municipal self-determination, but we can't have both. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Casey. I'll now ask uh, members of the committee if they have questions. Megan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Will you be uh, submitting a written submission? Uh, I've sent uh, the submission in. Oh. Okay, I must have, I'm sorry, I must have missed, I was looking at, oh, I see, it was initials. Thank you, sorry about that, I apologize. Thank you for putting that in. Um, Greg and then Jagrup. And then Mike. Uh, I wasn't on the list. You weren't. No. Okay. 
Uh, thank you, Casey, for coming and making a presentation about this very important issue to everyone, you know, people of British Columbia, the housing, housing affordability. So there are a number of things people are saying, like in the federal election, as you mentioned, there the promise was made that they're going to ban the foreign buyers and other stuff, right? And other people recommend other things. But you're recommending mandatory regional planning to deal with this issue. Yes. So I just want to understand, uh, combined with probably LRT, that's what you're suggesting, right? The, I just want to understand, like, what will mandatory regional planning, what, what, what do you achieve out of that? Well, it'll create the appropriate uh, zoning for um, uh, more housing. So, for instance, a municipality like Oak Bay wouldn't be able to ban duplexes, which in this day and age is an absurd um, zoning policy, a simple duplex uh, on a lot. Um, it'll also identify your transportation corridors. Um, in Alberta, as an example, the Minister, Minister of Municipal Affairs has the power to amalgamate municipalities uh, in the interests of um, housing affordability, transportation infrastructure. Um, having small municipalities with their own community plans is just a non-starter uh, in that province. Um, this province has promoted uh, in, uh, municipal independence and this has been to the detriment um, of, of, uh, of regional planning, in, uh, in, especially in Greater Victoria. So you're recommending this especially for Greater Victoria or through well, the province? Well, uh, I believe that Vancouver has something like 17 d uh, independent municipalities as well. Um, the supply shortage is very clear now. Uh, the lack of inventory. The property transfer tax is spiraling upward as a result of rising housing prices, and that's a result of uh, lack of inventory. And the inventory is being choked at the municipal level. So as I pointed out, there are 200 um, uh, development applications in the District of Saanich as we speak, some for multifamily, simple subdivisions, those kinds of things, and they go through this grueling, expensive process of trying to please small community associations because that's where the councillors get elected. And, and, and having a, um, a policy of increasing immigration by 55% in this country, it used to be about 200,000 immigrants a year, now they're boosting it up to about 400,000 a year. Most of those immigrants come to British Columbia and specifically Vancouver and Toronto, and expecting to have um, uh, housing, a reasonable, affordable housing supply as you boost, as you promote population growth, um, it's just not um, under the existing circumstances of small municipalities dictating housing. Um, it's not credible. But, but just the last question, if, if there's nobody else, um, Madam Speaker. There are, two, there are, there there are, are some other uh, questioners, but go ahead. Yeah, the, the, there has been discussion for too long about this, uh, the permitting pr process uh, by municipality taking too much time and province doing something uh, about that. But the regional, mandatory regional planning will not do anything with that. Well, what will happen is that the uh, municipalities will be told these are the appropriate uh, corridors for uh, density housing, it won't, there won't be a debate in terms of your official community plan as to whether you want to have duplexes or not. Um, if you're a core municipality, you will be expected to have higher density. Um, okay. and, and so the CRD's regional planning is, is not credible because it depends on 13 official community plans and they're all saying, we don't want any more housing. You don't have a single uh, purpose-built apartment in Machosan or in, or in the Highlands. This is not an ALR issue. This is an issue of people who don't want multifamily housing in their municipalities. Thank you. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, Mike has a question and Ben, and we'll probably oh, we're get we are out of time, but we'll uh, two quick questions. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Casey. 
Um, just for clarity, uh, Metro Vancouver's board's 21 municipalities, and uh, and their regional growth strategy is embraced by Metro Vancouver, and it's a 25-year vision. So my question is, is why can't that happen here? Because the reg the so-called regional plan in the CRD is dependent on the agreement of the small municipalities who will not agree to a regional plan unless it meets their official community plan. The regional plan does not override the smaller official community plans. How is it possible to say we have a regional plan for housing when, when Oak Bay uh, deems duplexes illegal? Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Casey. That was good to hear somebody speaking out about this. However, I think that one of the things that we're up against is the political willpower to deal with this. And, you know, having been Minister of Municipal Affairs dealing with the 11 or 13, it's not that easy to get consensus. We tried to do a sewage treatment system here and couldn't get agreement. But I admire and appreciate that people are thinking like that. From a cost point of view, okay, there's a recent report out that CMHC and uh, the province of BC uh, looked at, and it did talk about timelines. It's one of the recommendations government's considering. I think that timelines or timeliness in, in application process certainly will help uh, force the issue in having to make decisions. But you, you raise another really valid point about the lack of integration in terms of the longer term vision of what this is going to look like, at, you know, the uh, southern tip of Vancouver Island. So I think that there's options out there and it's going to take the political willpower to get there. I want to ask you as a builder, how much the step code is increased costs in terms of, or likely to increase costs in terms of uh, new home construction today? Well, what you have is the step code is not a step code, it's a leap code. That was a misnomer. That's another myth. Um, the public thinks that the increase in energy efficiency takes place in steps. That's what the title tells you when, in fact, you have municipalities going uh, from from building code into step three and then leaping into step five. So you have several municipalities in Vancouver leaping into step five. Um, step five will add, will add about $100,000 uh, to the cost of your home uh, in this market. Um, we, we crunch the numbers on step three, about $30,000 uh, added cost to the home. And um, that's, not, that's not just our concern. Our concern is that um, we follow issues such as radon, which is being investigated by the National Building Code. The BC Building Code has an agreement to harmonize with the National Building Code. They circumvented that, implemented the step code, while the National Building Code right now is investigating the impact of radon on very energy efficient homes. So an SFU uh, prof uh, tested homes in Vancouver, uh, West Vancouver is an example, that's considered to be low radon in British Columbia and found very high levels of radon. Radon without proper mitigation, and there is no mitigation required in many of these areas. Um, uh, very energy efficient homes draw. Uh, you create a vacuum and it draws through the ground, through cracks and holes in the foundation, uh, radon into your home, and they have higher levels of radon, which causes, it's the second leading cause of lung cancer. These, um, we've already gone through leaky condo, uh, urea formaldehyde, asbestos insulation. Um, these are Excuse the me, unintended. Casey, we're way over time. Okay. So if all you right. could just. Well, all I'm saying is that before you increase energy efficiency, do your due diligence on behalf of consumer protection. It's not just a money issue, but the money issue is is very big in 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 British Columbia with the highest housing costs in Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. On behalf of, of the committee, um, there, we've had a lot of presentations about uh, you know, grappling with the issue of, of uh, lack of housing, and um, your presentation is a very important uh, piece to that puzzle. And uh, thank you for that. Thanks. Our next presenter is MJ Whitemarsh, BC Common Ground Alliance. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. All right, this is probably my third or fourth time here representing the Common Ground Alliance, and it is a common problem that we, that we, that we uh, speak to. You do have a written report in your folder, so I'm not going to regurgitate it. I'll, I'll just give you some highlights. Um, 
So last year when we were here, we related the increased impact of homeowners during COVID tackling home uh, improvement projects. Uh, we call them our weekend warriors usually, but last year they became everyday warriors. And the incidences of um, damages to underground infrastructure almost duplicated what we had had for the whole year the year before. But this committee determined that they would give a recommendation, and recommendation number 109 said that it would require all homeowners to contact BC One Call prior to digging on their property to avoid any damage to underground infrastructure. And for that, we were grateful. However, we're not sure what's happened to it since then, but I'm sure somebody somewhere is doing something. Recently, our, our recent challenge has been with election signs. We had election signs being pounded into uh, the ground at interest, inf, inf, ugh, can't talk today. intersections and also people in their front yards and breaching water lines and uh, natural gas lines. People think they don't have to call before they dig, but they do. Underground pipes, power lines and cables may be closer to the surface than you think. Digging in the wrong place, even with a trowel when you're digging in your garden, can breach an underground line. And... Um, you will find out if you talk to Minister Farnworth that that happened to his own dad in his backyard. And then what happens is it cuts off services to entire neighborhoods. People have no power. Uh, the first thing they do is call the 911. First responders are taken from where they need to be and they're out checking what's happened. As a safety consortium, BCCGA hopes that this practice, calling BC One Call First, becomes as natural as wearing a seatbelt when, when you get into your car. But since I've been here four years in a row talking about this in different instances and how it's growing, and I, you know, there, I have colleagues at the table here that have joined me on, on podiums to, to speak of it, um, You've got to ask yourself, without government intervention, how are we ever going to get people to comply? What more can we do to protect our underground infrastructure, the workers that work on them, businesses and myriad others that are impacted by damage? This summer we wrote to six ministries because ours is not a unique incidence for one ministry. We have a multifaceted industry impact. We, we, we hit a lot of them. Underground infrastructure hits a lot. So we wrote to six ministers and we asked them to join us uh, in a cross-ministry task group and see if we together could find a solution to amplify and reinforce the, the importance of underground safety. Uh, I've only had two responses. I can't say, I would love to say that it was overwhelmingly uh, good response, but it was not. And we don't know what else to do. So I'm here on behalf of BCCGA to ask if this committee will recommend this year that an intergovernmental uh, task force be set up and whatever it costs to put it in, we will, we will come with the money and, and match it as much as we can out of the bit of money that we do have to make sure that we, we get some conclusion to this. We're not sure that legislation, 10 years ago when we started down this road, we wanted it legislated. We're not sure legislation is where we need to go, um, but we do need to do something. And it's, it's, it could happen today, it could happen tomorrow, it can happen next year, that somebody is going to break a main line and you are going to impact everybody's traffic going home from work one day, hospitals won't be able to get ambulances to them. It, it, it will be horrible. We don't want that to happen. Thank you. Thank you, MJ. Uh, and I'll now ask um, the committee if they have any questions. Lauren. Thank you, MJ, for your presentation. Um, can you give a sense? You said that uh, it doubled the damage that was done by uh, not calling. Can you give a sense of what that has cost the taxpayers over the last year to make those repairs? No, I'm sorry, I can't, but I will, I will get as close as I can. I could probably give you 2018 statistics, but because statistics that are put in are voluntary, it's like herding cats to try and get it all together. Um, but it is considerable. I can appreciate the uh, herding cats comment, but uh, I think that that would be a significant selling feature for your project, you know, to be able to show, because I can imagine that the damage is is very significant, and I can imagine it's cost taxpayers a lot of money. Well, it, it would have. 
Uh, last year with our presentation, we did give a four-month window of how, um, how many more damages had happened during the, the first four months of spring. And every year in April, we do a, a safe digging month, and we have an event, and we have an MLA breakfast or a breakfast or a lunch. Uh, and, and we go through the statistics and everything that are there. And in that four-month window last year, it was about $3.6 million, hmm. four months. And that was only homeowners. Uh, ben. Thanks very much, MJ. Um, that's frustrating to, you know, do what you're doing and we're getting worse statistics. How do you see the Intergovernmental Committee uh, being helpful and effective? Well, Ben, because we don't belong to one particular ministry, for, for a long time, um, uh, Peter Fassbender, when he was the minister here, he, he um, started working with us, as did Greg. Uh, then uh, Minister Farnworth thought public safety should look after it. But we hit so many other different ministries that there really isn't one ministry that you can say that the policy or the procedure for that particular ministry includes underground disturbance. It's huge. Mm. On federal government lands, uh, you cannot dig unless you call before you dig in that particular province or area. Mm. Provincial lands don't do that. And it's hard to get a lot of municipalities to comply either because they're so fractured. Okay. Any, uh, Greg. Well, thanks, MJ. It, uh, it seems to me that uh, pulling the different ministries together and having that initial conversation and getting some agreement at the outset shouldn't be too monumental a task. And you also indicated that you're willing, or your organization is willing, where you can even match and contribute towards some of the funding to these initial consultations. Absolutely, so, yeah. Well, I, I don't think what you're asking is, uh, is insurmountable by any stretch, so uh, I'm, I'm hoping that... Uh, or the well, it's all about will be public safety. To, absolutely, you know, and we've certainly seen that in other jurisdictions where somebody happens to hit uh, the wrong line at the wrong time, and, and as you've indicated, can be extremely costly. And uh, and the preventative side is something we should certainly be focusing on uh, as a province. So, thank, thank you for you. your presentation. Thanks, Janet. Uh, yes, thanks, MJ. Um, this has been very enlightening, and um, I look forward to our deliberations and to you know figure out what we can do to um, um, promote this kind of safety. Thanks Thank you so much. Our next presenter is Aaron Sutherland, Insurance Bureau of Canada. So, Aaron, you have five minutes to make your presentation. Um, the light will come on green when you have two minutes left. We'll indicate when you have 30 seconds left, it's time to, to wrap up. Uh, red light when you hit five minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions. If I get to 30 seconds, I'm rambling, so okay. <laughs> uh, we'll be lost. Uh, no, I, I just in light of today's different format than we usually do, similar to MJ, I've been here a few times. I've met quite a few of you. I thought I'd just keep it fairly brief in my remarks, but it's certainly been a, a busy time for the insurance industry in the last few years in this province, so I'd leave as much time as possible for questions. So I'm Aaron Sutherland. I'm with the Insurance Bureau of Canada, so we're the National Association of Canada's home, business, and private auto insurers. And so today, when we think about budget 2022, what we would strongly recommend, and I'll, I'll focus on three things, though there's many more in our submission. The first would be, relate to the province's climate adaptation strategy. The last time that document or that plan was updated was 2010. Um, to suggest it's woefully out of date is a bit of an understatement. And so in budget 2022, given the increasing impacts we are seeing from our changing climate, we would strongly recommend uh, that a significant focus be on increasing investment in measures to better protect our communities from the new weather reality that we face. Uh, what we've seen in Lytton from the wildfires this year and uh, in other communities across the province, uh, in MLA Kylos, uh, Stewart's and other regions, has been absolutely dev devastating and is an indication that much more needs to be done to protect our communities from, from that risk, but also to understand that risk. Um, but with the fires having brought so much destruction to our forests, when we think about the rains that are going to come this fall, that is going to bring a significantly increased flood risk uh, and chance of flooding, which is, again, a further challenge for communities. And so, again, we would also recommend that the province increase its investment in measures to better understand the flood risk facing communities across the province 
and also redouble its efforts to better protect those communities going forward. Uh, you know, we constantly think about climate change as this future threat. Um, and we, we know in BC, we've been a leader uh, in mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. We believe the province also needs to be a, a leader in adapting to the climate change that has already occurred. Um, so that's the climate risk. The other piece I would, I would mention is that, you know, the other big natural risk we face in this province comes from an earthquake. There's a one in three chance a significant earthquake will strike southwestern British Columbia within the next 50 years, uh, and we're woefully unprepared, uh, particularly in this building. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, we think, you know, much more needs to be done to uh, better educate consumers and British Columbians about that risk. Uh, and also just to improve our financial resiliency going forward. We are insurers, so that's, you know, a key piece of uh, consideration for us. And, you know, we would welcome uh, a strong voice from the province of British Columbia uh, in encouraging the federal government to to particularly uh, take stronger actions uh, in that regard as well. Insurers are primarily regulated federally, uh, and we'd like to work closer with uh, the federal government on how we can improve our financial protection from earthquake. Happy to dive into the details if you guys want to. And then the third thing I would, I would mention uh, just relates to strata insurance. Um, it's no secret that, you know, we've seen significant challenges in the strata insurance marketplace uh, throughout uh, 2020. This year, the market's largely stabilizing. You know, we've heard reports of premiums, you know, um, stabilizing or increasingly coming down. That's a good thing for consumers. But it shouldn't be any reason for us to take the pedal off the gas as it relates to the important work uh, government's done uh, to... Uh, bring in legislation uh, last year, looking at how we can improve the risk management of strata corporations themselves. We haven't seen the regulations uh, to to ultimately improve things there, and so we would we would also love to see in budget 22, if not before then, uh, really uh, you know continued effort, continued investment to to reduce the risk facing strata corporations, um, just to make sure that the challenges we saw in 2020 remain in 2020 and don't you know rear their head around again in a few years. There's quite a bit more in the submission, but um, I'll just pause there and happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Uh, I'll open it up to questions from the uh, committee. Lauren. I just wonder if uh, you could expand on the last um, item that you were talking about, the uh, cost of insurance for Strata in 2020. What, what exactly drove that? I mean, I can imagine it was large claims, et cetera, but... Can you be a little more clear about that? And thanks for the presentation. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's a complex question. So what, what drove the challenges we saw were, were multifaceted, but it's hard, it was a claims problem, right? Like we, we saw uh, too many strategies making too many claims because rather than, um, you know, building out a plan to make repairs to the roof or what have you, they were simply waiting, making an insurance claim. And for a long time, it was a very competitive market you know, if, if one insurance company felt you had too many claims, said they were going to raise your prices, you could shop around quite quickly, find someone else who wasn't, and, and you know, you wouldn't necessarily see a premium impact of failing to make adequate repairs to the strata, to your strata property. At 2020, that all came to a head. Insurers, uh, I think the regulator found since 2017, and if not before then, had been losing money selling strata insurance, and so prices corrected about 40%. Um, before that time, prices had remained very stable and f relatively flat for a, about a decade. So, um, you know, it was just a, a simple, you know, claims had been increasing, but premiums hasn't, hadn't increased to, to catch up to that. They have now, and so, um, again, you know, we haven't heard as many challenges. And, you know, there are still some stratas facing challenges where they continue to have claims, claims issues. But by and large... Uh, we aren't receiving anywhere near the same number of, of concerns coming forward from strata corporations. And again, I think if you focus on the fact that it was a claims problem, you know, how do you treat that? Treat that? The, the best thing you can do is prevent those claims from happening in the first place. And that's where BC, our strata re legislation is a little bit, uh, has a few more holes in it than um, other provinces across the country as it relates to the requirements for building repairs, things like that. Uh, the legislation has, has been introduced to allow those holes to be closed, but the specific regulations to do that uh, have yet to be brought forward. We would again just, you know, suggest doing so with all urgency. Thank you for that. And, and you did say that uh, they've now stabilized or in many cases are coming down now for these? Yeah, so I believe the regulator is going to do another data analysis uh, either later this year or early next year. 
Uh, we had Deloitte go out earlier this year and do a bit of analysis of the market, talking to brokers, talking to strata corporations themselves, and they found that premiums had stabilized, yes. And we know anecdotally that uh, a significant number are also seeing premium uh, decreases as well, and, and that's a good thing for consumers. Thank you. Mike. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Aaron, for your presentation. Uh, in, in light of the most recent wildfires uh, that's happened, uh, I, I believe everybody in this room heard it uh, loud and clear, you know, whether or not it was their primary residence or their recreational properties, that you know we couldn't get insurance. Uh, insurance premiums were, were you know skyrocketing and, and various things like that. Um, and we also heard some of the successes with fire smart programs that are out there that actually save people's houses and whether or not it was roof sprinklers or things like that. Is there, is there anything on the horizon uh, from the insurance industry as to incentivizing, or that's the word I'm using today, um, somebody's property uh, for that fire insurance? Yeah, so um, in terms of, you know, the incentives the industry is, is looking at. I mean, a, a key one is sort of building materials in areas of fire risk. And so they're, you know, they're looking at how can they better incentivize people to build with fire resistant siding, fire resistant roofing, uh, materials like that uh, in areas where fire coverage is, is particularly low. So that, that is certainly underway. And you, you will see, you know, insurers increasingly bring forward discounts uh, to account for those. I, I would flag that that's just one piece of the overall premium puzzle there. And so, you know, we also need to, as much as, you know, there's only so much consumers themselves can do, you know, they also need their community. Uh, we need to be, when we think about our land use and how we're developing, uh, that we're taking that into account as well. Uh, and making sure that these communities have the appropriate fire guards in place, the, the resources to actually, you know, contain what is an increasingly um, threatening risk uh, right across, you know, right across the province. As it relates to just your comment that you couldn't get fire insurance, so insurance is, is widely available right across the province. There isn't anyone who couldn't obtain home insurance, which would include fire insurance, uh, except at a time when their house is at imminent risk from a wildfire. And so insurance is for unforeseen risk. So if there's a wildfire coming down the hillside behind you, and you at that point decide to go out and see if you can find it, uh, that's a little bit different. That At that point, it would be much more difficult. Uh, but... Um, I think we probably, we've got, what, six areas under evacuation alert right now. Outside of those areas, you shouldn't have too much of a hard time getting uh, fire coverage right now okay. Thank across you. the province. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Lauren. Just along that same line, not so much a, a question but a, a comment. Certainly, uh, I was surprised at how many people were caught without insurance, not because of unforeseen risk, but because they had just closed on a home or... Uh, property transfer had happened, right? So there is a, it's, it's a, actually startling to me how many transactions uh, left people very fearful for their properties. And I'm not sure that anything can be done about that, but ultimately uh, all those folks closing during that time had huge risk, of course, to their property. Yeah, and I think, you know, what, what was a little bit different this year than in past years is so usually we're able to get these fires under control quite quickly and then these restrictions ease back off. You know, this year, think of the White Rock Lake fire. You know, it was a couple months before we ever got that thing under control. And so these restrictions were made in, remained in place for far longer than we would have been used to. And so, you know, when you think about the number of properties that may have seen transactions that would have been caught up in this, it was quite a bit, quite a bit larger. I would, I do worry uh, that this is, just a sign of things to come that just how concerning our wildfire seasons could be going forward. I mean, just look at California. I can't remember a, a summer where that province hasn't been on fire. Um, you know, but there are things people can do. You know, we've worked closely with the, the Realtors Association to make, you know, to talk about the need to um, try to move home sales if you live in the interior outside the months of July and August. Uh, but also if your home uh, has been sold or you have sold, purchased a new one, you know, you, you can often work with your insurance company to transfer your coverage from your current home to the new residence or take over that person's insurance coverage. Uh, so there are some things you can do if people have problems that's one of the or challenges there. That's one of the things um, my organization does is, is, is help break down some of those barriers and improve that understanding. And so uh, my contact information is certainly available. And if you do have constituents coming forward facing challenges, please don't hesitate to reach out to us because Again, one of the things, key things we want to do is make sure people um, have the help they need in their time of crisis. I will reach out for sure because I think, uh, you know, an information piece on something like that for constituents throughout the entire province could be very valuable. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, thank you, Aaron. Um, actually, we are out of time now, um, but um, your um, your presentation has been um, uh, thought provoking, <laughs> and uh, the, the the theme that seems to be running through it is uh, prevention. That we need to be thinking ahead in Absolutely. terms of, of what the crises could be. You come here. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much for having me. Thank um, you. Is your life working cool? Fire. Our, uh, our next presenter is Nick Sandor uh, with a Men's Therapy Center. So Nick, you have five minutes. Uh, there is a lighting system. Uh, the, green, the light will turn green when you have two minutes to go. Uh, we'll give you a signal when you have 30 seconds so that you know it's time to wrap up and then the red light will tell you that your five minutes is up. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for your time today and your service to our communities. Um, so I'm here today to advocate for funding for gender-based violence. Uh, my name is Nick Sandor, and I'm the executive director of the Men's Therapy Center, and my pronouns are he, him. Um, so when we talk about gender-based violence, a lot of the work that we're doing is supporting what happens afterwards, right? We're not foc focusing a lot of our attention on how to prevent this from happening in the first place. It's intervention-based. So um, Jackson Katz, who is an activist and advocate for um, men really doing better in our communities to stop these problems from happening in the first place, likes to frame gender-based violence as a men's problem. We need to start working with men. And we're positioned in this interesting place where we're supporting survivors of sexual, physical, um, and psychological abuse and trauma, um, but we're also working with people that cause harm. Um, and we see this in the statistics and the work that we do every day is men who experience sexualized violence as boys go forward in their lives when they don't have support and they tend to recreate those behaviors that happen to them, right? We see this in models of cycles of violence. Um, we're one of the few agencies in the country that does this work. And if we actually want to lower the rates of violence against women, especially indigenous and trans women in our communities, we have to be working with the men. We have to stop these cycles of violence. Um, so today I'm going to share a little bit more about what we do and, and really what we need. The financial breakdowns of what we're advocating for are in the report that I provided. Um, our services see about 200 to 300, or 250 rather, to 300 men a year um, for trauma-based counseling. Most of that is individual. We do groups. We do um, victim services and community outreach. Um, and it is very challenging work because when we work with these men, we don't have access to, like, um, I guess, services like safe houses, other resources for men. So we're going well beyond that counseling, or I guess well beyond that counseling role um, in this work. And we're exhausted. Uh, we have a wait list of over 100 men. Our therapists are burnt out. They're volunteering so much of their extra time just to support these men because we're worried about the men on these wait lists. We have men that continue to live in abusive households because they have nowhere else to go. There isn't a safe house for these men, right? And if we can work with these men who are in that space of experiencing violence, but also perpetuating violence, we can actually change that. But we need the resources. We have the skills, we have the drive, we have the capacity to do that work. Whether it's more workshops on consent, whether it is supporting men that has, have caused harm and creating resources for them to change those behaviors, we have the knowledge and the skills and the capacity to do that, but we don't have the financial resources. Currently, from for most of our operations, our funding comes from fee-for-service, community grants, and private donations. We do have a couple um, grant programs through the Solicitor General's office, um, but most of it is the work we're doing out in the community, right? Um, so it'd be great to see the government help to provide um, support for operations costs so that um, we can really lean into this work and, and make a change in you know, the, the amount of, um, I guess, sexualized violence and other forms of trauma that are happening in our community. And there are opportunities for program funding and lateral growth, but that's not what we need. We really need to strengthen our core operations and our counseling services, right? A lot of these program-based fundings, um, organizations such as ourselves are using to try to prop up our operations. Um, and what results is our operations aren't run properly, nor are these programs that we apply for in these grants. The other thing that I want you to consider is 
Um, as one of our clients put it, without places like the Men's Therapy Centre, these men have nowhere else to go. And on a political, social and cultural level, we see what's happening with the divisiveness in, in our culture. When these men don't have a place to share their stories, when they're not believed, that's where they find belonging in place like incel groups and alt-right groups. And we see growth in these groups. We can, in the work that we're doing, catch men and offer them a different alternative than more of those, I guess, um, discourses and ways of thinking that do cause so much harm. And I'm really excited to do this work in community. We have great community partners like VSAC and peers, and collaboratively we can work together to support diverse people in our community, right? Um, when we work with men, that also includes gender non-conforming folks, and we do lots of learning and lots of consultation to work with BIFO, uh, BIPOC folks, um, our, our queer and LGBTQ uh, community, um, newcomers. There's just so, it's really a diverse set of how we think about masculinity and masculine identifying folks. Um, the other thing I'm worried about is the ability to actually keep these services going um, in the future. We're struggling to get by. And without these services, I don't know where these men are going to go. And on a personal note, I know what this feels like. When I was eight years old, I was sexually assaulted by a a medical professional and it took me about 20 years to be able to actually talk about that, um, find the right supports for that and I'll say the effect it had on my own self-worth, my relationships, my intimate relationships in my life, um, I had a lot of unlearning to do and I know for a fact that the men that come in, I see the change in them every day, I see that people believe them, that they're supported, and I see them acting different in their relationships. And we can seriously make an impact on gender-based violence if we start working with men and changing the way we think about masculinity. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Nick. Uh, questions uh, from the committee? Mike. Um, thank you, Chair, um, and, and thank you, Nick, for your uh, for your presentation. Uh, th there's a, there's an awful lot of emotion uh, in that presentation for sure. Um, my question is: is um, you've got a hundred on a wait list, uh, and uh, you're you're coming here with some specific funding, and we have your other partners uh, speaking right after after you as well. Um, what what time frame? What like when we give a certain amount of money? How long does it take to clear off that wait list? Yeah, I've, I've recently been able to hire more counselors. Our biggest issue is because we're a nonprofit with very little financial resources, we have a heck of a time keeping counselors, right? We'll keep them for a year or two, and then they'll go to Island Health or private practice. Um, so there's a lot of interest in working because of the, the specialized type of therapy that we offer, um, but we can only usually keep people for two or three years before they're off. And that's such a loss of knowledge and resources as well. Um, and also it's sometimes we have to be really careful about how that impacts the men ac accessing services because we're leaning into a space where we're working with really inexperienced counselors because they're the only people willing to work for the wages that we offer. Okay. It's your group. So do, you, do we have more centers like you uh, in the province? Uh, that's one thing I would like to know. And second, the, um, at this point in time, do you have any funding at all from the province or federal government or any other level of government? Absolutely. So provincial funding comes through the Solicitor General's office. We receive, um, and for long-term funding, we receive about uh, $74,000 through civil forfeitures for youth crime prevention, which is one of our specialized programs. Um, the other funding we receive is about $93,000 a year for our victim services program, so our community-based victim mm -hmm. services program. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, we do work in collaboration with a lot of folks in the province, kind of catching different areas of this work. Um, but we're um, one of the few kind of, I guess, counseling-based services that has the victim services support and the counseling support, specifically working with men. Um, the one other service that I guess I could call like our, our sister organization is um, the BC Men's Sexual Assault Center in Vancouver, and our organization is actually born out of that organization. They dropped the Victoria branch, and since 2003, the two founders of that organization picked up that work. So we do work closely in collaboration with them. Otherwise, it's like national bodies like um, White Ribbon, um, Next Gen Men, um, folks that are working to address healthy masculinity, and of course, our local partners like Peers and VSAC that provide support for other types of folks. 
Thank you for your question. Is, is there any uh, other province providing constant annual operating funding for this, these kind of programs? Not to the best of my knowledge, no. I know there's a couple of similar services in Ontario, but that's about it in Canada that is actually doing trauma counseling with um, explicitly masculine identified and non-gender conforming survivors of sexual assault. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other uh, uh, questions. So Nick, on behalf of the committee, I would like to thank you for your presentation and uh, thank you for the work that you do. Um, uh, I think, you know, we, we talk a lot about gender-based violence and what we can do to support the survivors of gender-based violence. And um, what you've addressed is uh, healthy masculinity, which of course must be such, it's, it's key to that and it's part of the prevention. Uh, so thank you, and also thank you for sharing your story. Absolutely, I thank appreciate you. that. Thank you for your time and your service in our community. It means a lot. Thank you. Our next presenter is uh, Sophia Chevarella, uh, representing Peers Victoria Resources Society. So, Sophia, you have five minutes. Uh, there's a little lighting system. Uh, when the light turns green, it means you have two minutes left. Uh, uh, you'll get a signal of when you have 30 seconds, which is you know time to kind of wrap up, think about wrapping up, and then uh, the red light uh, says your five minutes is up. Hello, everyone. My name is Sophia Cheverella, and on behalf of the Peers Victoria Resource Society, we are proposing several recommendations that support increasing safety and access to needed violence prevention services for sex workers in British Columbia. Founded in 1995, Peers Victoria is a grassroots, multi-service, and peer-based organization for local sex workers. Sex workers face multiple barriers to accessing justice or support after experiences of violence. In two recent BC studies, it was found that sex workers report higher rates of violence compared to other Canadians and lower confidence in the police. In a 2016 study from Victoria, when asked about the past 12 months, 25% had been touched against their will in a sexual way, 20% had been forced into unwanted sexual activity, 18% had someone take or try to take something from them by force, 30% had been attacked while working, and 10% had been attacked or threatened with a weapon. However, only 14% of these cases were ever reported to the police, and of those, only a third ever resulted in an arrest. In Victoria, 63% of sex workers say they have little to no confidence in the police. In a 2015 study, study conducted by Swan Vancouver, 95% of immigrant and migrant sex workers said that they would never consider talking to the police about violence. Considering sex workers' distrust of the police and reluctance to access conventional justice services, Peers Victoria makes the following recommendations. One, increased funding for a provincial bad date and aggressor reporting system. Bad date and aggressor reporting represents an alternative to conventional reporting. Here, a bad date refers to a negative encounter between a sex worker and a client, ranging from harassment to violence. BDR systems allow sex workers to report these violent encounters to the community, distribute, dis distribute offender descriptions to the rest of the community, and allow sex workers to better screen clients and improve their safety. While sex workers are distrustful of the police and afraid of stigmatization or criminalization when reporting violence, community-led initiatives such as BDR are critical to sex workers' safety. Currently, five partners, including peers, are developing a province-wide BR tool. We are pleased to receive provincial funding for this program through civil forfeitures, but additional funding is needed to increase the number of sex workers and community organizations that can participate in the project's consultation phase. And there is insufficient funding to sustain the project after initial implementation. At such an early stage, funding is critical to launching the project effectively. Number two, increased funding for peer-based services. As an alternative to conventional justice services, research has found increased access, service retention, rates of satisfaction for sex workers when services are provided from a peer-based model. Peer-based models also have shown to increase trust and disclosure among sex workers, allowing them to better spread awareness and instances of human tra trafficking and exploitation within the community. Peer support and advocacy and safe inner circle spaces are also recommended by existing research as key needs for survivors of sexual exploitation. In fact, sex workers' own successful efforts to prevent and reduce sexual exploitation in their own communities has already been recorded in Canada. Provincial funding would increase the success of and build infrastructure for these initiatives. Number three, increased focus on core funding and funding for ongoing services over pilot projects and new initiatives. Most public and private funding streams that are relevant to violent prevention for sex workers are focused instead on human trafficking. This perpetuates ongoing policy misunderstandings that conflate human trafficking and sex work. This isolates sex workers who are not victims of trafficking but do experience violence from necessary resources and services. Moreover, funding which does exist is short term and emphasizes pilot projects or new initiatives over core funding or maintaining ongoing services. Without stable funding, sex workers are left in a precarious situation where life-threatening and necessary services could end abruptly with the loss of a single grant. 
Provincial funding for violence prevention services for sex workers would fill a critical gap in supports for a population that faces disproportionate violence. Additionally, options for core funding and funding for ongoing services will create sustainability of services and a continuity of care for sex workers accessing necessary supports. As established by the second recommendation, a plethora of research exists on violence prevention, for, on violence prevention services for sex workers. Furthermore, local agencies on the ground are best suited to understanding the needs of their own communities. Provincial funding for peer and community organizations will ensure money is going to initiatives that are already connected with and trusted by local sex workers, the people who best understand what is needed for violence prevention and support and supporting survivors in those communities. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sophia. And I'll um, uh, invite members of the committee to um, ask questions, seek clarification. As your group. Thank you, uh, Sophia, for coming to make presentation for this uh, very important group of people. Uh, I just want to know, uh, like, is there, is there any helpline for the sex workers or there's nothing like that available? Uh, there is not, but um, as I stated, we are developing a provincial-wide reporting tool which could include a helpline. So that would be a helpline? That, w that, could, that could include a helpline. We're still, we're still developing the tool that it would be. So do you have funding for that, or uh, you We just... have funding to initially implement the, to create the tool, but we don't have funding to sustain it after the fact. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I don't see any other uh, questions, Sophia. Uh, but on behalf of the committee, um, I would like to thank you for your presentation and uh, thank you for um, speaking up for sex workers and uh, uh, addressing uh, the violence uh, that they face and uh, offering um, some concrete solutions to protect them. Thank, thank you very you much very for your much. time. Zimmerman, uh, Victoria Sexual Assault Center. So Elijah, you have uh, five minutes. Uh, the light will turn green when you have two minutes to go. Uh, you'll get a signal when you have 30 seconds within which to wrap up, and then red light when your five minutes is up. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Chairperson Rutledge. Thank you, Finance Committee, for meeting with us today. And I also want to express um, gratitude to Nick and Sophia for also presenting uh, in a group together as we, we do serve this community together in a, a form of collaboration that I'm grateful for. Um, the Victoria Sexual Assault Center, we're a feminist organization dedicated to healing, prevention, and education for all women and trans survivors. Um, I'd like to talk today just a little bit about um, most specifically our direct, direct client services, although uh, our prevention area is growing and we do see a need for that. Um, I believe I sent around some things. I don't know if you're able to look at those or not. Um, I just wanna point out a few things that we offer for direct service, which are our clinic, which is a one of a kind based clinic here in Canada. I know there's other places trying to model after our clinic, so this is something we've been had in place for the last five years um, and is really meeting a need in our community. We also have an access line uh, that was truncated a few years ago from a 24-7 line. It's just a Monday through Friday line now, and the evenings are staffed by volunteers. And, of course, our counseling services, which we see quite a few people in the year. One thing I want to point out about our clinic, it's 24-7, 365 access. Uh, and the clinic operates just like any clinic there. Uh, forensic nurse examiners come in to meet with survivors. Um, it's a more comfortable space. It has all the access to tests, uh, any kind of forensic kits you need. Uh, we see about 120 sexual assault response cases per year in this community. And 70 of those are routed through our clinic. Um, some of those folks may have wanted to go to our clinic, but if there's any kind of um, exacerbated issue with um, broken bones, any kind of other wound that needs to be attended to in the hospital, they do have to go there. Um, in terms of those 70 folks, each one of those folks approximately saved the province $1,370, about $95,000 a year for the province going through our clinic versus using emergency facilities in the community. We also have a police inter room, interview room on site, so it helps um, with survivors being able to go from one room to the next if they want to do it at that time uh, in a private space, they can also come back at another time. Um, just like to point out, we do have known funding for that until 2023. Uh, and I think 
partly from this committee in the past. Funds have been routed through Ending Violence Association BC and have gone to select sexual assault centers throughout the province. So also I uh, want to point out this time that um, we are a sizable sexual assault center, but there's many other sexual assault centers across the province in urban areas and uh, core rural areas. And many of them are trying to get up similar programs, sexual assault response programs. Um, they're just getting started, but for them as well, it's after 2023, where's the funding come after that? So that's a big question that we have. To run the clinic successfully with all the programming, all the materials, clinic coordination administration, it's about $300,000 a year. Um, just to give you a cost on that. For our access line, we get around 3,000 plus calls per year. It's often our first point of contact with our services, whether that be for the clinic or the counseling or victim services. We currently have no dedicated funding for that, and that approximately costs $70,000 a year. For our counseling, this is a bulk of a lot of our direct client services. Um, we see 280 clients at least a year for crisis counseling, 268 for long-term counseling, and about 200 clients for victim service counseling. I do want to point out we do have 250 people currently on a long-term wait list. At this stage, even if we got the right funding, it would take us six years to meet all those people. So while we do have funding from PSSG that covers about 80% of the cost for this counseling service, BSAC covers 20%, we figure there's at least a 50% unmet need in our community for those long-term services, which we just, we just can't accommodate. Um, one of the things to point out in terms of crisis services for the summer, over the summer months, we had uh, 12 sexual assault response team requests each month. Um, and in terms of different cases coming out, you may be familiar recently with someone who's a driving school instructor who um, has allegations, allegations of sexualized violence. Um, we get an increased number of people also needing to connect with crisis counselors because it has resurfaced trauma for them. So we are definitely seeing a greater suicidality and greater homicidiality with our clients, which is definitely a strain on our counselors. Um, so I'd really like to impress on you today with my partners here from Peers and Men's Therapy Center um, that sexual assault is a public health issue. And in that sense, we would advocate that the Ministry of Health get involved with some type of funding model for us. Um, in particular, the BC Health System, their priorities are urgent and team-based care, a focus on mental health and trans-inclusive services. Um, that's definitely what we're doing, and I know my other partners are doing similar things. In terms of urgent and team-based care, we have that with the clinic. That would require $300,000 a year. Mental health care, it would be great to have one FTE at around $100,000 a year to ensure that we have some person in place for that. Um, and also we're making, uh, all of us have endeavors for trans-inclusive services. Um, that does cost money as well to train everyone to make the services available. Um, to have $10,000 a year or $20,000 a year does not cut that when you need staff in place to run that. Um, we do have best practice models. Um, we definitely have the best practice model for clinic in Canada. Um, and then lastly, I just want to add here quickly that um, we need to be resourced to develop community-based, peer-based, indigenous-led sexual assault response and long-term care programs as well. Um, we're currently working with a network called Kwanatinitel Ii Sa'et, um, and we need funding to work with those partners in different band offices and local First Nations to ensure that it's culturally relevant and culturally safe services for everyone in our region. Thank you. Thank you, Elijah. Uh, Megan has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the uh, your presentation today, but also for the submission. I, do, I really like the uh, layout of it, how it's set up almost like an infograph. I'm wondering, uh, in the part about talking about additional funding needed to meet the demand, and you start to talk about triaging. So you mm -hmm. talk about triage one, two, mm -hmm. group, and long term. I'm wondering if you can provide just a little bit more information about that and uh, what the what the impact is it has been and and what the impact would be if there was an additional funding. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. So triage one, uh, those are folks who are youth, uh, anyone who's been sexually assaulted within the most recent 14 days, and also Indigenous clients. Um, I want to point out for our clinic, we serve everyone 13 years and up, so all genders, all people. Um, triage two are people who have. Um, are in crisis, but maybe it's a, a longer term sexual assault beyond those 14 days. Um, uh, group folks, these are people who've probably already gone through our triage, triage system, and we've got four different groups set up over a six month period that people can build skills. Uh, and the long term, this is the only um, regionally, I think, and provincially, we have some funding for people to do long term, one year counseling to do deep trauma work. Um, so if we don't have funding, what often happens is like, I think currently we have 25 people on our 
triage list for two. Um, we try to get everyone in triage one within a week, but what often happens is we have two or three access line workers, and once you have um, sexual assault response coming in a couple times a week, those people are also working to support those people at the clinic, and it can be difficult to get back to everyone in a timely manner. So this is a main thing that for us would be a priority in terms of funding is to ensure when someone calls, we can get back to them immediately. Uh, just at this time, we don't have the funds to have all the staff to meet the demand. So just as a point of clarity, Madam Chair, uh, are you saying that uh, triage one, which is a child, could be waiting up to two weeks to have initial contact made? Unfortunately, that does happen. Okay. Um, although we do in our triage system, we prioritize youth. So that would be those we get to as fast as we can. Um, and this is a point for my staff that is quite painful because obviously everyone understands the need to meet those folks immediately. And we do know from data that when survivors are met with care, the sooner they're met with care, mm -hmm. the greater their potential for long-term health and well-being is. So the longer they have to wait, the more layered um, experience that they have of that trauma and more health care that they need moving forward, which costs more money. Thank you. And thank you for, for the in-depth answers. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Any uh, additional questions? Thank you uh, for, um, for your presentation and um, uh, the work that you do. Um, the um, Victoria Sexual Assault Center is uh, recognized for its leadership in this, uh, in this area. And in your presentation has made it very clear um, why it's recognized and why it's important. And, I, and I, uh, I'm certainly struck by uh, the implications of someone uh, going through a trauma of sexual uh, violence, um, having the courage to make the call for help, and, um, and then having to wait. And the impact that that must have on your staff of not being able to respond immediately when you know they need to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman Rulich. Thank you, Finance Committee. And our next presenter is Isabel McKenzie, Office of the Seniors Advocate. The Seniors Advocate. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and good afternoon to uh, members around the table. And I think that you have a copy of a PowerPoint or a slide presentation. I'm going to refer to some numbers in shortly. So as the Seniors Advocate for the Province of BC, I do thank you for this opportunity to share with you my priorities for the next provincial budget. And I do want to begin by acknowledging the tremendous efforts of the past 18 months by all members of the Legislature in raising the issues of concern for seniors who live in long-term care. And I know that there has been a significant investment of financial resources over the past year and a half to stabilize long-term care. And I recognize the impact on the budget. Uh, but while budget investments in long-term care are crucial, we cannot forget that 94% of seniors and 72% of those 85 and older still live independently in their own home. And there's more we can do to better support their independence. I will note that in the most recent budget, the senior supplement, which is provided to the lowest income seniors, was doubled. And it is important to acknowledge this positive progress. The main focus of my presentation today is an issue that I've spoken on before to this committee, and that is our home support program and the financial anomaly we have in this province with a system where we provide financial incentive to the individual to move to long-term care, while the taxpayer is providing a higher subsidy uh, for long-term care than they would uh, for that person to be in the community. So I'm gonna go uh, refer now to um, these uh, slides that talk about our home support uh, challenge. Currently, 67% of newly admitted residents to long-term care received no home supports 90 days or more prior to their admission. So that's the context within which we have done this analysis. Our current client co-payment for publicly subsidized home support would require an individual with an income of $28,000 a year to pay $8,000 a year 
for a once a day visit of home support, which is almost 30% of their income. However, in long-term care, we cap the amount you pay in long-term care at $3,400 a month, um, regardless of whether your income is $56,000 a year or $156,000 a year. So when we look at the home support challenge, we can see that, number one, the co-payment is a challenge. It is too expensive for some who have no uh, financial ability to uh, otherwise provide home support. Care planning is not flexible. Scheduling can be fragmented. The public system does a very good job at delivering some types of home support services and is less successful at delivering other types of home support. There are staffing challenges uh, within the public system, limited capacity for overnight live-in and morning services. And it is uh, estimated to cost about $44 an hour for each hour of publicly subsidized home support that is delivered. If we go with client direct funding, which is a program that does exist but has uh, capacity to grow in the province, the cost lowers to approximately $32.74 an hour. It can be flexible to client needs. It can redu reduce the staffing burden on health authorities. And um, we do have our CECL model or Choices for Supports and Independent Living model that can demonstrate the effectiveness of this. The economics, um, so this is what I, I really want to hit on here. The average cost of a long-term care bed in BC is $84,680 a year, and that will rise with the challenges we have committed to meeting, that will rise. Of that, 63,000 is subsidy, and 21,000 is resident copayment. Eight hours of care in the community would be about for 365 days a year would be about $77,000 a year. And so if we calculated a client's contribution to um, uh, long-term care and deducted that from the amount of the bed and provided, if not all, but a significant portion of that subsidy for the person to be able to care for themselves in the community, I think we would be able to see some diversion. So uh, target for client direct funding, um, we did some analysis of admissions to long-term care. 40% of admissions to long-term care co-reside with a caregiver. 34% have no aggressive behaviors. And 26% have what we call an ADL or activities of daily living score of four or less. All of those are people who could live successfully with supports in the community or in assisted living. That is a total of 2,467, or 26% of our new admissions every year. If we were able to successfully divert even half of those, we would free up 1,233 beds a year. If we were to divert a quarter of those, we would free up uh, just over 600 um, beds a year. And there's another slide with more um, supporting data. Uh, the one I really want to draw your attention to is the distressed caregiver. So of people who are admitted to long-term care, the percentage with a distressed caregiver, and when we look back in the client file, we are not finding the kinds of supports for that caregiver that the system is there to provide. We are not finding that they had home support. If they had home support, we're not finding that they had very much of it, and we're not finding that they were able to utilize adult day programs. So we've got supports out there. There. We've got a group out there who clearly need the supports. We're not connecting them, and we need to find a better. And if we do that more successfully, we will increase our capacity in long-term care of much-needed beds and allow us to use revenues that will be needed for additional new beds to refurbish the beds we have that are old, three to a room or more, or two to a room, and address the fact that not just do we need more staff, we need to pay the staff more, and that is going to be a significant um, pressure, uh, budget pressure in the years ahead. And I'll leave it at that and take questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Isabel. Um, questions from the committee? I guess we're a bit overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a lot of numbers. And as I say, I would focus on the finance, the economic one to, mm -hmm. to understand why we should be making this shift. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Greg. I just want to say thank you to <coughs> for doing this exceptional work. Uh, that's very important to hear from you, uh, raising, these issue, raising these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, you know, the whole concept of aging in your home for a longer period just makes so much financial sense. Uh, where do you see the impediments? Why is government uh, late to the table to provide the funding to provide that extra assistance to allow people to stay in their home longer? Is it, well, I guess, what, what could be done for, for those folks that maybe don't have a voice and are maybe struggling uh, and suffering in silence, so to speak, uh, to make their point? Because it, it seems that the financial case is certainly there. We know that the cost of, of uh, seniors when they transition to long-term care facilities is much more significant and a much higher cost. Uh, why do you see the hesitancy or, I guess, reluctance of government to get ahead of this? I'm not sure. It's long-standing. The regulated client co-payment for home support has existed for the entirety of my career, which is 25 plus years. Uh, we are one of the few provinces that do it. We don't. They, it's not done in Alberta, for example, or Ontario. So there's the regulated. I don't understand. The, there is a reluctance to look at this co-payment. But that, I would argue, is half of the issue. The other half of the issue is that the system is designed to make the easiest pathway into long-term care. I cannot emphasize enough that if you have 67% of new admissions to long-term care effectively going from zero care to total care, there's a failure somewhere in the continuum. Because what you should be seeing, you will have catastrophic events that will trigger that, but they are few and far between. What you should be seeing is a slow progression. And for most people, that progression will end far short of the door of the long-term care home. But you should be seeing some supports in the home, and then, if necessary, moving into a supported environment like assisted living. When you look at it, our financial incentives to the consumer are driving them into long-term care. Yet our financial incentives as stewards of the public purse should be to move the money that way. So if you, if you do the simple math that says the average subsidy is uh, whatever I said there, $60,000 a year, think of the families if you said to them, we will provide you with $45,000 a year to support your mom at home or your spouse at home. Could you do that? Some of them will say yes. Not all. Not all. Because they'll have to contribute as well. But some could. Because the other challenge is the cap. So regardless of your income, you pay a maximum $3,500 a month in long-term care. There's nobody in British Columbia who was denied a public bed because they have too much money. That's, that is simply not correct. We do a financial assessment. We take 80% of your income. We cap it at 3,600 a month. We do a physical assessment to determine that you physically require the bed, and that's it. We don't make a value judgment. Thank you. Harwinder. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Isabel, for your ongoing advocacy. Uh, uh, for our seniors. I have a comment and then question. Um, caregiver burnout, thank mm -hmm. you for highlighting. It is a very serious, concerning, and bigger issue than many people realize, and we've seen that. There is a respite care that's four hours, but then I know from my experience that you get special permission and whatnot. Uh, what are your thoughts about the recently added, I don't know if it's recently and now, a couple of years, 24 hours care? I know it's a patchwork like between hospital transition while they're waiting for long-term care. What was the feedback that you received? And under better at home care model, uh, like, would you like to share some of your thoughts uh, um, Coming from healthcare, I know that was pretty helpful for us mm -hmm. when we were trying to transition our seniors who now need long term care before they will be waiting in hospital and not getting the care or the activities that they need. Uh, what are your thoughts on that uh, program? The model of 24 hour care at home, which uh, is generally for a short period of time and often accompanies a discharge from hospital, 
can be very successful and can divert an ultimate admission to long-term care. And my office has done some work on that. We've got some data from some studies that show it can be effective. Again, not for everybody, but it can be effective. Better at home can also be highly effective. Uh, it has been expanded uh, and is now in more parts of the province. And with the work of the committee that uh, your chair was part of during the pandemic, we now have the 211 access number throughout the province, which is incredibly helpful because you can just phone 211 wherever you are in BC and they can look up how to connect you with whatever local agency is needed in order to provide those services. They can be key to keeping a person at home. But the nuts and bolts of the caregiver distress comes when uh, it's not about the um, doing the laundry or getting mum to the doctor's appointment. It is when you cross that threshold and you need some serious help. And that's where I think we could do more. We would be giving people what they want and we would be at a minimum not spending any more and we could potentially save a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit. Um, and everybody would be able to, and we would have more bed capacity, and we could have more capacity in our formal home support program by taking out those people who could be diverted because of their intense care needs to direct care funding. Thank you. A quick follow-up, Chair Freeman. Way okay. Sure. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, we could talk about this for, for a long time. I'm really sorry. We have to, uh, no. to cut it off. We have other people who no, are no, waiting my to apologies. make a presentation. No, not, nothing to apologize for. Uh, I want to thank you uh, for your presentation. Um, I, and thank you for your leadership and advocacy on this. I think that there's probably most of us in this room um, have uh, loved ones who yes. um, have uh, been in long-term care. And probably not one of them said, Oh boy, can't wait, I'm going to long-term care. Uh, it's been a traumatic experience and we need to figure out ways to yeah. keep uh, people at home where they want to be. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Our next presenter is Rick Fixaland. Uh, Federation of Community Social Services of BC. Good afternoon. Madam Chair and committee members, and it's a pleasure to be here meeting with you. Um, I, uh, there's a, we sent our presentation in, which I'm sure you have in electronic form. If I read it really, really fast, it takes me 25 minutes. So I'm not, right? So I'm hoping you can read it for the detail that's in there. It, there's a lot of detail in there that's important. Um, I'm just going to hit a couple of highlights that um, I want to draw your attention to. Um, first of all, for those of you who don't know, the Federation of Community Social Services of BC um, is uh, a provincial organization. We have over 140 member community-based uh, community service organizations, um, totaling over 6,000 employees about $1.7 billion in budgets, um, and in um, almost every pro uh, community in this province. Um, it ranges in small size from little bitty, you know, uh, one person with volunteer organizations to very large uh, multi-billion dollar organizations. Um, it's very typical of community social services. Um, <clears throat> I've been coming to this committee for eight years, um, so if you look back at those presentations for the past eight years, you will see a litany of challenges that this um, sector faces. Um, and just before the pandemic uh, started, uh, every one of those challenges persisted. So nothing had changed over that period of time. In fact, very little has changed in the positive over the last couple of decades. Um, and during the pandemic, we have now, of course, layered 
um, other issues on top of the ones that we, that we were facing up until that time. So now the situation we have is that we, the pandemic's not over. Um, uh, the pandemic has um, amplified the mental health and addictions crisis in this province. Um, so we have the issues facing, facing us from the pandemic, the issues that are um, increased with regards to mental health in this province and addictions. Um, and the overdose crisis, all of these are laid on top of each other. 18 months ago or so, Dr. Bonnie Henry asked me, asked our sector to stay on the job. And our sector did stay on the job when other businesses and other parts of um, the province had to close down and did close down. Um, uh, we did not. Um, we have... Um, uh, in order to stay open, sometimes it meant the executive director of an agency doing frontline work on the downtown east side because we couldn't get the em employees, either employees had become sick uh, or they were off the job for their, because they'd been exposed, etc. And so uh, the staffing shortage and recruitment and retention issues that we faced before the pandemic are now amplified to an extreme level. Um, uh, talking about the issues, um, I heard Isabel speaking and I totally support her recommendations and know Isabel very well and these are uh, challenging times for the long-term care sector. But the health sector in many um, uh, job classifications, um, the pay is as much as 40% more than the same job with the same requirements, education, et cetera, and same duties as in the social service sector. Uh, this gap in, um, in pay, this pay inequity between social services and health, social services and education, uh, makes it almost impossible to keep uh, the uh, doors open. And we have, in fact, lost a lot of agencies, and we have agencies that many of the services that they um, would like to be providing, they can't provide because they have to use the staff they have for the more emergent services that are required. Um, the, uh, the other challenge facing us is um, uh, we are working very hard as a sector to live into truth and reconciliation and to decolonize this sector. Many of the problems that we see that we are caring people for are the consequence of colonization and with indigenous people, but also uh, the impacts on, um, on increased sexual violence and, uh, and other uh, results from colonization. Um, and so it is important that we decolonize this sector, and yet we need government's participation in that and partnership in that, um, and we need um, the indigenous communities and the indigenous uh, agencies to, to um, be the leaders in that and not try to use, not try to decolonize the sector using colonial practices. Um, so these are the major challenges. Um, I, um, I, I'm going to stop now because I'd like to hear your questions. Thank you, Rick. Um, Megan has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your presentation. And I've had an opportunity to read your submission. Uh, my question, I guess, is, as I read through it, if we had to summarize what, what you've identified as priorities for this report, I would appear that you're looking for a 5% increase across all of all of the um, agencies that fall under this would would be sort of your recommendation to address the challenges. Have I have I summarized that? Um, yeah, um, here's the deal. <laughs> um, the list of things that are needed in this sector to shore it up after so many years of neglect right. um, is long. Um, but uh, what we're doing is saying, okay, well, there's one thing you could do. You could do that. And that would help. That would get uh, money into the core of these agencies that are, right. that are faltering. That would be enough to, to start the process. Okay. All right. So that's great. Thank you. And, and then just the second part of my question with that would be if, if there was a necessity to sort of look at this um, 
in sort of an incremental way, where do you think the most urgent need right now sits? Because I do get from your, your presentation there's a crisis um, from your report, but where do you see the starting point right now? For me, um, it starts with children. Um, uh, if, if we don't start uh, supporting families and children, especially indigenous families and children, right now we simply are downstream uh, um, pulling the bodies out of the river instead of going up and fixing the bridge that people are falling off of. Uh, so uh, particularly in the area of, of mental health, mm -hmm. but mental health issues and addiction start in early childhood before you, you're doing, before there's any diagnosis or any of the rest of it, it starts with uh, the stress that uh, young people are facing. And we need to start relieving the stress that young people are facing. Wonderful, thank you so much. Do we have any other uh, questions? It looks like uh, it looks like there's no questions. It looks like uh, uh, probably most people have read your uh, read your brief, um, and uh, we'll spend more time uh, digesting it and deliberating. Uh, thank you uh, so much for your presentation, and thank you for um, the the passion that you've uh, that you've shared with um, the urgency of us uh, doing something about this, and that um, you've made it very very clear that prevention um, is the best um, is the best approach that um, uh, the, and the importance of the social service uh, sector. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee members. We have a, a one more uh, presentation before we take a, a bit of a break. Uh, Emily Rogers is here uh, representing Together Against Poverty Society. Thank you, Madam Chair. I recognize I'm the only thing in between you and a break, so I will <laughs> try to be succinct. Um, so Together Against Poverty Society is an anti-poverty legal advocacy organization that serves people on southern Vancouver Island. We represent people in government decision-making processes as they relate to the Residential Tenancy Act, the Employment Standards Act, and the Employment and Assistance Act. Our work is hard. We often feel as though we are plugging holes on a sinking ship. And one of the only things that keeps us going is the hope that we might be able to influence you, the government, to uh, renovate the ship. So we really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today and appreciate the invitation greatly. So I'll speak to you briefly about the three areas of work, the three pieces of law that uh, we interact with the most. So income assistance. We wholeheartedly support recommendation nine of the basic income report, which would raise the disability assistance rates to the poverty line. We feel that is a moral imperative to implement this recommendation and feel that it is extremely urgent that you do so. Similarly, recommendation 25 of the basic income report asks that you combine the shelter and support portions of the income assistance provision and make that payment uh, non-contingent on whether someone has housing. We similarly believe that it is urgent to do this. Finally, as it relates to income assistance, we believe that mental health services should be offered in Schedule C of the Employment and Assistance Act for people with disabilities. And this would mean that someone on PWD could access mental health services as part of the benefits that they receive. From our work, we know that a large proportion of people on PWD are receiving those uh, benefits because they have a mental health related disability and it only makes sense for them to receive health care that's related to that disability. In regards to employment standards, I'll move on to our second piece of legislation. In regards to employment standards, uh, we believe that this current government has made much needed progress towards improving the legislation and improving workers' rights in BC. Um, we looked at the recent service plan and the commitments in there are promising, including strengthened complaint mechanisms, increased proactive enforcement, and developing precarious work uh, strategies to address the gig economy and workers therein. 
we still see that there are significant failings at the branch. And the only way that you will be able to uh, make true on these commitments is if you fund the branch. Um, as it stands now, the branch is only responding to complaints uh, that we made 18 months ago before the pandemic. And that's, in a lot of cases, it means that justice denied is, uh, or justice, sorry, justice delayed is justice denied. It, it, it's simply not sufficient to come to a complaint 18 months later, especially for um, many of the most vulnerable workers who we represent. Additionally, there's been mishandling of complaints at the branch due to understaffing. Uh, regularly, branch workers are prioritizing voluntary resolution as opposed to making sure that the employer is uh, held accountable to the act and the worker accesses justice. And time and time again, unfortunately, branch workers are giving our clients incorrect advice in an attempt to expedite the complaint, which we understand, it's understandable that they would do that, but we believe with increased resources we could prevent that, and thereby we're asking for at least an 11 million uh, investment in employment standards branch, which would bring us back up to um, a rate that we saw before uh, a few governments ago. <laughs> and finally, with housing, I'm sure you've had many presentations on housing and I uh, will not belabor the point, but in Greater Victoria alone, we've seen 7,000 units of developer private market built housing over the last five years. And yet my job feels increasingly uh, desperate and urgent and impossible as people from all walks of life come to us um, losing their housing, unable to find housing, and certainly unable to find housing that they can afford. And I can confidently tell you that many of my clients will die before they find housing. That's just simply a reality. So a massive expenditure in affordable public housing is uh, the most urgent thing that you can do at this time. The severity of the housing crisis translates into increased demand at the RTB. At the RTB, it takes weeks for complaints to be processed and months for matters to be heard. Um, thank you so much. I'm gonna move on to my last point. I see that I have 30 seconds. The most cost-effective thing that you can do is vacancy control. I know it takes political will to do this, but it is the most cost-effective and important thing you can do, and it is the only thing you can do to tide or stem the ties, stop the bleeding essentially associated with this housing crisis. It ties the rent to the unit rather than the renter and takes away the economic incentive for landlords to evict people and that is what we need right now. Thank you, Emily. Um, questions from the committee? <clears throat> Shagroup. Thanks, Douglas. Uh, you have covered a lot I have. <laughs> on that file, so thank you very much for that uh, information. And uh, the, uh, the first question I want to ask you, the income system, there's always a debate as to what is the right amount of income assistance, mm -hmm. uh, where we go. So you're saying, basically, bring it to a poverty line. Uh, do we know like what will be the cost if we bring it there? So that's one thing I would like to ask you. Mm -hmm. The second one related to that is you are saying that don't tie it to, to the somebody renting a place. Uh, I would like to know what the logic or argument behind it, if you can explain that to us. Sure, I'll answer your first question and then maybe ask you to repeat the second one. I'm not sure I, quite sure I caught it. Um, so the cost associated with bringing income assistance or disability assistance rates to the poverty line is included in the bank basic assist basic income report that get the government completed a few months ago. I didn't bring that figure with okay. me, but it is okay. included under recommendation nine of that basic income report and it's fully costed in that report. So um, I, I'm... The second one yeah. was you're saying that uh, don't tie the income assistance with renting a place. Yes. And uh, so I just want to know, like, what is the argument for that? The argument for that is that even if someone doesn't have um, stable rent costs, they still have costs associated with living, and the support portion of around $400 is simply not enough to survive. It's simply not enough. Um, so by tying those amounts, you give someone a fighting chance to even have the ability to find a place, to rent a place, to look presentable for those rental appointments, to organize oneself for those rental appointments, um, and to have the resources that one needs to just survive to get oneself to those rental appointments. My last question is vacancy control. We yeah. did put uh, tax on that, indeed. 
lower mainland, right? So I don't know whether that's here or not, but um, mm -hmm. what do you recommend for vacancy control? So vacancy control is different than the vacancy tax. Vacancy control um, is a form of rent control in which the landlord would only be able to increase the rent by the allowable rent increase, regardless of whether there's a change in tenants. So right now, if a tenant is evicted or moves out, the new rent is unregulated. It's set by the market. Okay. Oftentimes, that's 50%, 100% more of what the first tenant was paying. Rents really do double um, in between tenants. And that's really escalating the cost of housing across the province. Mm -hmm. The penalty for moving right now is $356. So the cost of a occupied unit versus the cost of a unit on the market right now, the difference there on average is $356 for a, a comparable unit. So that means that someone's monthly um, cost of living increases significantly just by um, losing their rental housing and trying to find new rental housing. So we'd like you to close that gap. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Ben. Yeah, thanks very much. So, Emily, did you submit a written submission? No? Okay. We, because of we would still like to if there's time, but... You do, until Thursday at 5 o'clock. <laughs> So I, I do want to ask you a question, and this is something that I heard from people in the Okanagan recently, is that the, um, the absorption of a lot of the housing, doesn't matter whether it's affordable or not, mm -hmm. has been taken away by uh, things like Airbnb mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've looked at uh, mm -hmm. that, the impact of that in this market. Obviously, COVID's probably impacted that somewhat, but yeah. the claim is that uh, they're making as much in a week as they'd make from renting, and they have none of those controls that Jagrup just mentioned a yeah. minute ago. Um, and I guess, the, you know, the... Um, so I don't know if that's been looked at by groups, because, you know, um, another yeah. thing that I just recently came upon was that some of the uh, landlords were where utilities were included, and because they don't regulate them and they're not their own, mm -hmm. are separating those and now entering into a contract where the rent is one thing and the, regula the unregulated part is the utilities. And I think that that goes with taxes and some of the other things that go along with it. So the rent controls might give that sense of security. The rents aren't going to go up, but there are costs that are outside pressures that the landlords are just passing along. And that is that is a problem. So I don't know if the vacancy control, I'd like to know more about uh, how that is because, uh, you know, the marketplace usually dictates. And I still think that if it's going up, that means there's not enough supply. And that goes back to other greater problems, mm -hmm. that the supply isn't being addressed. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is municipal or uh, provincial, kind of something that we have to kind of help incentivize if we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, there's a, a lot of content in those comments. Um, it, with regards to Airbnb, that is certainly a factor, although during the pandemic, we saw many of those units return to the market and it didn't make a significant impact. Okay. Um, I will include some more information about that in our written report, so thank you for that cue. Um, secondly, I'm trying to remember all the points that you made. They were good ones. Um, costs that the landlord incurs that they're passing along? Certainly yes, although I have been in hearings in which the landlord is held accountable for the amount of utilities, residential tenancy branch hearings in which an arbitrator uh, corrects the landlord and how much their costs actually are. I'm sure. And um, so there is a mechanism to address that already. Yeah. Um, certainly it is something that some landlords will continue to try, but uh, vacancy control is the larger one because there are zero regulations and the landlord can lawfully increase the rent by whatever they want, um, which is the number one factor escalating the prices. And even if we add supply, if there isn't vacancy control, all of those units will continue to um, increase exponentially past what most people can afford. Mm. It's the type of supply that we need. If, we, if you want to build a lot of affordable housing, then we might not need to have this conversation. It but on. it's the type of supply that, that we're really looking at. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, Emily, we're out of time. Thank I you. think we probably have lots of questions for you. You, uh, you uh, are a, a very credible advocate. And um, you, um, uh, thank you for your, for your leadership on this. Um, 
So with that, we'll take a recess until uh, 3.10. And uh, thanks again, Emily. You, um, you made a really good case.
and uh, our our um, next uh, presenter is Enid, Enid Elliott. So Enid, you have um, five minutes. There's a lighting system. When the light turns green, it means you have two minutes left. Um, we will give you a signal when you have 30 seconds left so you can you know, be wrapping it up. And then the red light uh, says, uh, the red light indicates that um, your five minutes is up. And then we'll ask you questions. Okay, that sounds good, thank you. Okay, well, good afternoon. I am Enid Elliott, and I'm an early childhood educator uh, teaching uh, in the early learning and care faculty at Camosun College. And I'm grateful to be a visitor on the territory, Lekwungen speaking territory, where people have loved their children and cared for this place for thousands of years. I represent um, a group of educators, um, practitioners, and researchers who, uh, the Nature-Based Child Care Advisory Committee, who have actually just finished a Zoom call. It came rushing here from a Zoom call that we had with Katrina Chen. Um, and uh, I'm really happy to be here to share a message with you. So outdoor programs for children are not new. They are common in Northern Europe and other parts of the world. And in BC, we have a growing number of outdoor programs for young children, but many of them are not licensed. Currently in our province, we license facilities, not programs. So programs that are outside all day have no regulations and cannot be licensed. Parents want outdoor programs for their children. Aware of current research that illustrates the many benefits of being outdoors for children, as well as the pandemic instructions to go outside, parents are choosing to have their children outdoors. And programs have been popping up to meet this demand. These programs fill up fast and have waiting lists. And often they're only half day, so they don't meet the demand for childcare. These programs are not accessible to all parents because without a license, parents who need a subsidy to attend a program cannot apply for one. Also, the program will not be able to receive money that they may need to help support a child with extra needs. Another concern about not having the regulations or licensing is, is that there's no oversight of these programs. We need to move towards creating a category for licensing outdoor early childhood programs. Washington State has recently licensed outdoor programs, and like us, they faced a shortage of childcare spaces, and this proved to be one avenue to creating more spaces. Like us, they had more and more outdoor programs that were operating without a license, with parents choosing these programs for their children. And like us, not, like us, not all parents there had access to the programs. And they began to be concerned that there was no oversight or regulations for these programs. Newfoundland also is currently looking at how to move forward with a category of licensing outdoor early childhood programs, as they also have realized this is an important issue. Because outdoors, children move more up to 50% more, bending, stretching, climbing, lifting, running, and jumping. Children's physical, mental, and spiritual health improves outside in a green and alive space. The living, breathing earth is good for all of us, as we have experienced, at least some of us, this past year and a half. As Dr. Stanwick told me two years ago when I spoke to him about this idea, which he supports, the health of a five-year-old impacts the health of the 65-year-old she will become, which in turn impacts our health system. Hopefully, with time outside, children will also come to love the place in which they live. Love of land is particularly important to Indigenous early childhood programs. BC Aboriginal Head Start has moved their programs increasingly outside, with recent grant money going to enhancing their outdoor spaces. 
As her representative on our advisory group says, children playing outside with just a few toys, but definitely with lots of soil and rocks and plants, experience inequality among themselves as they learn together from elders, from the land, and culturally land-based stories. Land as teacher is a concept we can all begin to embrace. Our group, the Nature-Based Child Care Advisory Committee, invites the government to enter into a dialogue to start a process to move forward to license outdoor programs for young children. We have recently been awarded a small grant to support a symposium to bring together key players to begin a discussion. And we would like some commitment from the government to begin to engage in a dynamic dialogue to move forward in creating this licensing category. It is possible to go outside with children. It's possible to have programs that spend most, if not all, of the day outside in all types of weather. When we have children outside connecting with the birds, the wind, the rain, they are learning to be members of the larger society. The community that includes the life found outside, we all need to listen to these voices. We live in a beautiful province, and we want to honor this land and the peoples who've cared for it and encourage all those who are growing up here to care for it. So thank you for your attention, and I'd love to answer any questions in the next five minutes. Thank you so much, Enid. Um, so I'll entertain uh, questions from the committee. Mike. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Eden, for your presentation. Um, so basically, it's uh, there's there's no there's no regulation. There's there's no license. So where does that that process start? Well, I think the process starts in recognizing probably that there's a, a need for this um, to to happen. And the way Lice, uh, Washington State went about it was that they convened an advisory group that um, set up um, uh, some regulations, set up, you know, sort of parameters for programs and then had some pilot programs for two years, at which point they had um, a set of legislation that they, that they put forward. And, and, and actually it was interesting because apparently the legislature had no difficulty passing the motion because apparently everybody in Washington sees themselves as an outdoors person. So we're right behind the concept of this, right? I, I think it's similar here in BC. Um, just as a, as a follow-up, what other jurisdictions are in Canada? that have this or, or are looking at this? Newfoundland is definitely looking at it. The Lawson Foundation actually gave us a little bit of money to start this process. And they also are supporting Newfoundland uh, because they are looking into it right now. And they are running a, test, a pilot program. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Ben. Um, thanks, Enid. Well, I, I guess I'm a little surprised that I didn't think you could do this. Like, I mean, here we are, we've got regulations in front of doing something that seems so natural. <laughs> but um, my question is, is Washington, you say that they've brought it in. Um, I, is your, do you have the information as to what regulations they put around it in Washington State? Yes, they actually have put out two reports now about their process of developing the regulations. And I think it was just in June that they actually passed the final set of regulations so that people can go ahead and set up outdoor mm -hmm. programs that, you know, that run a whole day. Well, I guess my only thought is you, if you could submit, uh, if you have that information, submit it to the committee before Thursday so that we can... Oh, I will. I will. Yeah. I'll send the link to sure. those two reports. Sure. That'd yeah. be good. Thanks. Greg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks, Enid, for your presentation. Uh, I have a niece that actually attends an outdoor school, uh, South Canoe Elementary in School District 83, and I don't recall... Uh, schools having to go through any legislative change in order to offer it. Why is there a need for daycares that are predominantly, I'm sure, that's, assuming they'll still need bathroom facilities and some kind of an indoor facility to run out of, 
I'm just wondering why would there be need to for legislative change if they're just going to spend you know 90 percent of the time outdoors rather than indoors? Well, the thing is, and it's good, it is a little confusing because I was part of setting up the nature kindergarten that now is in its tenth year in Souk, and the school district doesn't have the same set of regulations that govern uh, early childhood programs. So at this point, there's just no category that these programs would fit into, and which is so the need is to look at them. And when I started to think about it, I kept thinking, okay, so what's the difference, right? Because what we do now is license the building, right? So many toilets, so many square foot, so many toys, etc. Um, and and yet. Um, what we really need to make sure is, is that the people running the program know what they're doing. And I started to think about, well, you know, the thing is, we say that, you know, when there's a lifeguard on a beach, you can swim there safely. But when there's no lifeguard, you swim at your own risk. And so maybe we need to start looking at, you know, do we have people who can do these outdoor programs? And... Um, and anyway, and I think that that's kind of what Washington came up with, too, is the focus on the actual people who are running the programs and the ratio of adults to children. Anyway, I, dig I digressed a bit. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> no, that's helpful. Uh, I'm not seeing other questions. So with that, uh, Enid, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the committee uh, for your presentation. Um, uh, and, you know, this is food for thought. Uh, and I, also, I, I, I want to tell you that your presentation was very elegant and eloquent. And um, you used some terminology, uh, you know, in your land acknowledgement. You acknowledged people who have loved their children on this land for thousands of years. And that was, uh, that said a lot to me. Yeah. And the yeah. land as teacher um, yes. was amazing. Yes, it's actually very important to um, Indigenous programs, and, um, and, and I know BC Aboriginal Child Care Society is very supportive of this process as well. Anyway, thank you very much, you. And, um, and I'm glad it was food for thought. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter is Sean Blythe, a BC SCI Community Services Network. So Sean, you have uh, uh, five minutes. Uh, the light apparently will turn green uh, when you have two minutes left. Uh, we'll, we'll signal you when you have 30 seconds left so that you can know that it's time to start wrapping up. And then the light will turn red at five minutes. I'm just going to grab my glasses. I was going to be bold and try and do it without them, but I think I need my glasses. <laughs> so. I understand. I'm actually just being vain, not bold. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Sean Blythe, and I am the Executive Director of BC Wheelchair Basketball. It is a pleasure to be here in Victoria on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen people and to present to you the Standing Committee on Finance. I am representing the BC Spinal Cord Injury Community Services Network, known for this presentation as the network. Our goal is to help make BC the best place for people with physical disabilities to live, work, and be active. Formed in 2010, the network is comprised of BC Wheelchair Basketball Society, BC Wheelchair Sports Association, the Disability Foundation, the Neil Squire Society, and Spinal Cord Injury BC. Together, our five provincial organisations represent over 200 years of service delivery excellence in supporting British Columbians with physical disabilities. Why did we form this network? The simple answer is that helping people with physical disabilities to adjust, adapt, and thrive in their lives is complex work. While each of our organisations is known for doing a lot with a little, we all recognise that we could do a lot more by working together. Through the complementary services that we each provide, we help people with physical disabilities to overcome key challenges in their life, including social isolation and the physical and mental health issues that they face as a result. We help connect them to accessible housing, direct supports for daily living, gain confidence and skills 
to be ready to return to the labour market, access adapted technology resources, and engage in active, healthy lifestyles through sport and recreation, all of which help them become active and productive members of communities throughout BC. Our strength is that we connect an individual living with a disability to our joint services, even when they might not know that they need it. In recognition of the value of the network and the work that we have achieved through our collaborative, innovative approach, the provincial government provided a grant of $5 million over five years in 2017. During the last five years, in addition to our ongoing work, we have developed jointly funded projects, created shared service delivery positions in the Okanagan and Northern BC, worked with indigenous partners to begin to co-develop programming for indigenous individuals with disabilities, and we have leveraged the presence of our network staff across multiple areas of province and collectively reached more than 60,000 people living with physical disabilities in the last five years and more than 80,000 kids through our school's education program. We are here today to request a renewal of this funding of five million over five years so that we continue to build on the success of our networked approach in supporting the full and meaningful participation in society of people with a physical disability and continue our collective role as a vital partner with government as we work through the recovery from the pandemic. As we know, the pandemic has affected everyone, but it had a compounding effect on the multifaceted challenges faced by people with disabilities and their families, such as access and inclusion, isolation, physical and mental health, participation in the workforce, housing and supports of daily living. The pandemic highlighted the importance of the network's approach of our collective partnership. The five organizations quickly responded to the rapidly evolving pandemic by transitioning as much of our services online, providing timely health and policy related information to our members and staff. Over the last five years, over 18,000 people participated in our direct services and 353 unique visits were made to our online resources. Through our collaborative work during these challenging times, our members and clients have thanked us for their help, for our help. As one of our members put it, we are the go-to organizations for information and support from people who know what, we, what they are going through and how to get back to real living. This is in large part because 47 members of our employed teams are people with disabilities themselves. We are thankful for the support from the provincial government that we have been provided to date and with it we have made great progress, but our work is far from done. With ongoing support from the provincial government of renewed funding of five million over five years, our network will focus on the initiatives that align with government priorities in the areas of access, inclusion, mental and physical health, employment and indigenous reconciliation, and continue to be a vital partner ensuring that people with physical disabilities are included. We will continue to build upon our partnerships with our healthcare, research, tourism and other se sector partners to provide unique educational, event hosting and experiential activities for people with disabilities and their families. The next whole five years holds many challenges, but also many opportunities for us to continue to be a vital partner with government in ensuring BC is the best place for people with physical disabilities and their families to live, work and be active. I'm happy to answer questions and we will be submitting um, supporting documents um, by the end of the week. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, I'll now entertain questions uh, from the committee. Oh, Ben. Um, thanks, thanks very much, Sean. And um, we do hear a lot about this, but maybe not often enough. Um, in the last five years, since you got the initial five million, you had some targets and goals, etc. What's the what's the goals for the upcoming five years? What are you What are you going to do differently? What are you going to invest that money in? Um, certainly, we would like to see those numbers increase. I mean, we did plateau because of the pandemic, um, but we would like to see us definitely add another twenty five percent that we can reach with that funding. Um, a big aim is to um, employ an individual who is going to help us work with the Indigenous communities to really learn and understand the work that we need to do to help our services reach their communities. So that would be a big step. And really supporting the um, accessible legislation with ensuring that the services we provide can actually be operated in some of the facilities that we use. Mm. <coughs> I, uh, 
I don't know if I should say this. We had a little, uh, we had a walkabout in Richmond the other day, and I was with Stephanie Cadu, who's... Oh, right. Anyway, Stephanie and I were laughing about some of the obvious things. You think that things are accessible, and they're not. Anyways, we thought we should have a day dedicated to maybe some sort of green or yellow environmentally safe spray paint that identifies all the problems that are out there. Because I don't think a lot of us see it, especially able-bodied, so... Anyways. No, no, you're right. Um, so we, we certainly oh. don't. And um, just, just this week, one of my staff was doing a visit to a facility to see whether we could access their gym, because mm -hmm. trying to find space to actually play uh. with your basketball at the moment is a huge problem. And, and it was a new, they'd taken over a warehouse and built a court, and there was a toilet. And they said it was accessible, which it was to someone in a day chair, but the wheelchair basketball chair couldn't get through the door, so we can't use the facility. And it's just a simple thing, because once we got a wheel off and got through the door, we could use the toilet. But I'm sure you wouldn't want to have to take one shoe off and hop down the stairs without your shoes on. So, yeah. Mm. Any other questions? Mike. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you, Sean. Um, I have played that, that game uh, by invitation once, and I, I found some of those people very vicious, um, in a good way, in a good way. Um, so you've got a five-year period from 2017 to, to today, and you were established in 2010. Do you have like data that goes in front of it to show this is what we were doing, this is what we were able to do, and then this is what we're going to be able to do in the next five yeah, years? Yeah, we okay. have data from 2010 almost, okay. yeah. And that'll be in the submission? Yeah. Awesome, yeah. thank you. And I can tell you that in 2010, um, I know the number there was 13,000 that we reached with physical disabilities. Okay. Well, I don't see any other uh, questions, uh, Sean. I want to thank you very much on behalf of the committee for your presentation and for the work that you do. And uh, I noted, you know, you called it very complex work. And um, that certainly resonates with me. Um, Neil Squire Society is in my community. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to go there a couple of times and see what they do and um, the difference that they make in, in people's lives. Yeah, it's huge. So, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Sorry about that, I keep forgetting the, yeah. Uh, I um, uh, now would like to invite Tom Hackney of the BC Sustainable Energy Association uh, to make a presentation. Uh, Tom, you have uh, five minutes. Uh, we have a lighting system at, uh, uh, when you have two minutes left, it will turn green. We will signal you when you have uh, 30 seconds left so that you can wrap up and then at five minutes it turns red. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I believe I've timed this, so I hope I'll be all right. <laughs> um, hello, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, my name is Tom Hackney, and I'm the policy advisor for the BC Sustainable Energy Association. BCSEA is a registered charity with a vision for BC to meet their needs without harming future generations. Uh, BCSEA members are individuals, businesses, and practitioners who support a sustainable energy transition. BCSEA delivers public education and outreach and intervenes in utilities commission proceedings on energy issues. BCSEA also participates in BC Hydro's and Fortis BC's stakeholder advisory groups, such as BC Hydro's Technical Advisory Committee for the 2021 Integrated Resource Plan. For Budget 2022, BC SEA urges the government to prioritize these four things, greatly reducing BC's greenhouse gas emissions, switching energy use from fossil fuels to renewable energy, increasing the efficiency with which we use energy, and moving our economy to low carbon sustainable activities. The government has begun this work with the Clean BC Plan and it should continue. 
BCSEA supports the Clean BC for Industry program. The government should continue helping industries to move off fossil fuels and onto clean electricity or carbon neutral fuels. We commend the government for the Better Buildings initiative, especially those to get homeowners to switch from oil heating to heat pumps. We support the Clean BC Building Innovation Fund. These initiatives should be expanded to a province-wide program to upgrade the energy performance of the whole BC building stock. This would be a truly green investment, improving our efficiency while supporting skilled jobs that build a sustainable future. We commend the government for its work on transportation, especially transit improvements, and the commitments of BC Transit and TransLink to electrify their bus fleets. We appreciate incentives like the PST exemption for electric bicycles, the incentives to buy electric vehicles, and EV charging equipment should be continued to support the government's policy actions, including the low carbon fuel standard, the zero emissions vehicles legislation, and the mandate to BC Hydro and Fortis BC to build out a direct current fast charging network across the province. We support the government's heavy duty vehicle efficiency program. The government should increase incentives to electrify heavy duty freight transportation and should not rely entirely on hydrogen and other low carbon fuels in this area. And we support the work to electrify BC's ferry fleet. Uh, but we feel that the government is spending too much on general purpose traffic lanes and other infrastructure that induce more traffic and greenhouse gas emissions. We urge the government to seek solutions more in keeping with the Clean BC plan and the Pan-Canadian framework on clean growth and climate change. The planned large volume replacement of the Massey Tunnel, for example, would worsen our greenhouse gas emissions, as would highway widenings to increase traffic flows. BCSEA supports government's initiatives to develop a greener economy, including investments in innovative low carbon technologies and job skills. This is necessary work. BC will need to greatly reduce its heavy reliance on revenues from fossil fuel exports as we and the rest of the world increase our efforts to mitigate climate change. And finally, BCSEA urges the speedy adoption of the draft climate preparedness and adaptation strategy and budgeting to start implementation in Budget 22. And that's my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Tom. And I'll now invite uh, members of the committee to ask questions. Uh, Harwinder. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Tom, for your presentation and uh, for your written submission. Um, you mentioned that um, BC government should, uh, should increase incentive to electricity heavy, uh, heavy duty freight transportation and should not rely on hydrogen and other low carbon fuels in this area. Can you please elaborate? Why is that recommendation? Like, what are the concerns if we rely heavily on hydrogen fuels? Um, hyd hydrogen is, we, we appreciate a lot of effort is going into it, but it's a largely untested technology. And um, let's not put all our eggs in one basket. Electric, w w electricity uh, for heavy freight is also has problems because of battery size. Right. Um, we need to solve this problem and not just punt it to the future. Right. Thank you, a quick follow-up. So would you still suggest like we do both, like we explore both options or a little bit more yes. towards the, because that, that was my concern, the size of the you know electric batteries and all, so just curious. Yeah, yeah, yes, well, I think it's a very big problem. Environmentalists like 
me have been worrying <laughs> about it and many other people, I'm sure. And I, yes, uh, do some of everything. And there are many different applications for, for heavy duty freight um, from sort of short haul where, you know, a trolley, electric trolley might work to the longer haul. And, and there are many ways to design the freight system. Right. So um, we need to keep our options open. Right. Thank you. Other questions? Thanks for coming today to make uh, this presentation. The, uh, you know, you're talking about very important public policy uh, issue uh, today and moving forward in the future. Uh, sustainable energy transition. Um, I do understand, I, I have broad understanding the transition concept from a fossil fuel to low carbon energy. Uh, but at the same time, when you put that into practice, uh, that is not that easy, right? Because uh, you cannot shut down the fossil fuel uh, you know, industry and then start working on that one because that's not how it's going to work. Uh, you did mention one program, um, you know, as my colleague said here about the increased, what you call the electrifying heavy duty vehicles. Uh, I just want to ask you, uh, we have numerous programs under the Clean BC, uh, you know, policy. Um, is there any other province or particularly in North America uh, doing a different thing which we should look into uh, other than the heavy duty vehicle? Any other jurisdiction that is doing something at BC? Different and more effective than, than what we're doing here? Um, not, not that I'm aware of. Um, I, I think many jurisdictions are trying to do a whole bunch of things. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm actually not a big expert in what other people are doing. Okay. Um, so, no, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't really give you a very good answer there. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Ben. Uh, thanks, Tom. And uh, these are challenging questions to answer. Um, being that this is the Finance Committee, I guess the question is, is what is it that uh, uh, the BC Sust Sustainable Energy Association is looking for, and what does it want to use those resources for? Um, well, we're, we're not here to advocate on our own behalf on, to, for the public interest. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I may, I'm, I'm not sure if I understood the, well, the question. No, no. Well, I mean, these are pretty, uh, they're very broad objectives. You mentioned the four priorities as you, to what you see. Yes. And I guess the question is that some of these things, like you just mentioned to uh, uh, Emily uh, uh, Sadu, that you thought that the hydrogen solution wasn't the fully developed answer for heavy haul vehicles, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I guess, are you advocating that more money go into research or something like that? Because uh, I, I guess the only reason being is that if there's, you know, I mean, with what your goals or with those four stated goals, uh, where do you see us uh, progressing uh, the fastest to achieving those or working to support those? Um, well, well, I, I, I see these as um, more or less co-equal aspects of achieving the overall broad issue of, of decarbonizing BC entirely in its energy use and economy. Um, so the example I gave of um, a, a little bit of mistrust of hydrogen, um, I, I'm not trying to pick a specific winner here, uh, but rather to warn against putting too much um, effort on that particular solution. And um, 
in general, I, it looks to me as though the government is trying to um, simultaneously do a lot of, of research and development of solutions and, and a certain amount of implementation of them at the same time. And uh, we simply want the government to uh, keep on doing that, go farther and go faster. And again, <laughs> I, I hope I'm answering I, I'm answering your question. Maybe I maybe I've misunderstood. No, I don't think so. I just think that okay. everybody wants the magic bullet, and we want to get it done as fast as possible. The problem is that science is what's going to drive this, and I think, and uh, that's yeah. where I think that uh, the Sustainable Energy Association would be coming from. Uh, advising about you know kind of traffic and stuff like that. How do we bridge right. the gap? And you don't have have the solution to that. You just support the idea that the government continue on the path that it's going. So we don't. But and and I would I, I agree on the science. But I would also say political will and determination to achieve the end result is is yeah. of key importance. And, and having the government reflect that in its budget. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Tom. Uh, thank you, Tom, for your uh, presentation, and uh, thank you for um, uh, your leadership uh, uh, in this area, this very important area, and for sharing uh, your expertise. Um, yes, I, I for one, uh, I believe that climate change is something that, that is a priority and uh, dealing with it, and that we have to get down our greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, I haven't got a clue <laughs> where to begin to do that, and I rely on the expertise of people like yourself to help uh, show the way and, uh, and help um, uh, reinforce the things we're doing right and uh, make suggestions about the things we could do better and differently. So thank you very much for this. And thank you, ma'am, and thank you, committee members. So we'll now take a uh, five-minute uh, recess.
meeting. And our next presenter is Catherine Malloy for our grandkids, Victoria. So, Catherine, you can come to the table here. Yep, right there. Yep. Right there. Um, you have five minutes to make your presentation. Okay. We have a lighting system to help guide you. Okay. Um, so, at um, the light turns green when you have two minutes left. Okay. We will signal you uh, when you have 30 seconds left just so you can wrap it, know to start wrapping it up. Okay. And uh, the red light comes on when your five minutes is up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Can I take my mask off? Absolutely. Okay, phew. <laughs> so, thank you for um, this opportunity to present today. I'm grateful for the chance to have, um, to help shape the budget for 2022. And I respectfully acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the Lekwengen peoples, known as the Esquimalt and Songhees Nation, and of the Hussanic peoples, whose territory I have the privilege to live, learn, work, and play. My name is Catherine Malloy. I'm a volunteer with For Our Grandkids, which means I'm a nana. And uh, to six, I know some of you are also grandparents, some to five, some to six. Um, so I just want to acknowledge each of you. Thank you, first of all, for being on this committee. Thank you for putting your name forward and being elected officials. I think it's gutsy and um, more gutsy than me, but um, <laughs> I just want to thank you for doing that. And I'm here to um, acknowledge that and support you in the work that you do. So we are a group of grandparents that, um, based in Victoria, part of a larger network across Canada that believe that the future of our grandchildren is in jeopardy because of climate change. So we work to promote climate change education by um, educating and advocating to politicians and to offering um, courses on, say, things like um, uh, financial div divestment in oil, et cetera. And we even just walk our kids to school instead of driving them. And um, I just want to say that I also want to acknowledge the work that's been done on uh, COVID-19. And uh, congratulations for keeping me and my grandkids and kids and communities safe. And I know that you've done that by adopting kind of an emergency mindset to COVID-19. And I, I just want to urge you to do the same thing around climate change. So um, on August, August 9th, we heard from the IPCC that... Um, uh, their latest report, which is considered to be the most significant update on the current state of the climate, and um, it's abundantly clear that um, this update is uh, calling for a sense of urgency. So, quoting UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, it's code red for humanity. The alarm bells are deafening, and the evidence is irrefutable. So, climate change is upon us. We all saw that this summer with uh, 1,556 wildfires taking um, over 860,000 hectares of our forest. A small fact is that we don't actually uh, count the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, gas emissions from forest fires in our annual uh, greenhouse gas emission um, count. So uh, this past June, we had the deadly heat wave where we saw 570 people, sudden deaths uh, due to the heat-related causes. And so in one week, we saw nearly 30% of the total number of British Columbians that have died from COVID-19. So shockingly, also in the fall of 2020, the BC coast recorded the worst air quality in the world caused from the Washington State and Oregon fires. So um, I urge, I plead, and I beg the government of BC to adopt an emergency mindset to climate change. And uh, you can start that in the budgeting process. And that means we need to implement fast and critical changes now in order to meet our 2030, 2040, and 2050 uh, targets. So my kids and my grandkids are counting on it, as are many of yours. So I'm aware that uh, in 2018, the government launched the Clean BC Climate Action Plan with admirable targets to ensure achievement of Clean BC's goals. With that in mind, it's kind of hard to understand why the 2021 provincial spending budget reports say that 2.3 billion was spent on transportation infrastructure. Uh, some of that, a small amount, was spent on SkyTrain expansion, but uh, which is sensible, but most of it was spent on expanding highways. And uh, yet specific actions directly affecting climate change through the Clean BC budget, uh, only 170 million was spent. So on August 18th, in the height of fire season, the province announced a new eight lane tunnel to replace the George Massey Tunnel on Highway 99, with a cost estimated at $4.15 billion. 
Six of the eight lanes are dedicated to cars, uh, two to buses, and a fringe of cycling and walking paths where active transportation enthusiasts can suck the exhausts of the cars and the buses. So less than 5% of that budget has been awarded to sustainable transportation options. So billions are spent on highway expansion and only 20 million on emissions. So uh, it's irrefutable that uh, humans are causing climate change. So what can you do? As a committee in, and as your role as MLAs, you can make sure the infrastructure infrastructure budgets aligned with 2030, 2040, 2050 gas emissions, ensuring 10% of MOTI budgets go to active transportation, for example. You can make incentives to develop uh, back-to-work climate plans like you've done back-to-work COVID, back COVID plans, like um, incentives for businesses to encourage and support working from home. Um, there's, there's lots that you can do. Don't just trust technology, but uh, think about the carrot and the stick and the opportunity to give incentive and disincentive. Do what it takes to win. Spend like it takes to win. Um, create new economic institutions to get the job done. Shift from voluntary and incentive-based uh, policies to mandatory measures. Uh, tell the truth about the uh, severity of the crises and communicate the sense of urgency about the measures necessary to combat it. And I just want to say, be visionary. This is our opportunity at this point. It's a lovely vision for me to think of BC where all the government staff and all of the elected officials feel empowered to creatively develop and implement climate action plans and create equity and safety that um, promote health and well-being. And you have that power as elected officials and as members of this committee. And I beg that you do the right thing. Make climate and carbon reduction the number one priority in the 22 budget. So let's not be in a state of emergency, but let's be in a state of vision and hope. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. And now I'll ask um, uh, members of the committee if they have questions. Lauren. Thank you for that presentation. Um, uh, you touched on forest fires not, we're not calculating the uh, gases that are being emitted through that. Can you expand on that? Um, well, it's a, I did an article for in the uh, newspaper or in a actually Focus magazine and when all those forest fires were happening in 2020. And so it was through that, I wish I could find exactly that research um, detail, but it was that we don't count the greenhouse gas emissions from the forest fires in our annual count of greenhouse gas emissions in British Columbia. So we might count transportation emissions and emissions from um, oil and gas, but not from forest fires. So for example, in 2018, I think it was, there were four significant fires that came and they actually, just those four fires emitted 190 billion tons of CO2. And they're not, uh, they're not, um, they're not noted in our greenhouse gas emission um, measures that we have. Is there a reason for that? That's a good question. <laughs> Is there a reason for that? I don't know. I think it's, you know, it's the same thing as can we actually develop a climate budget, like we have a financial budget, so that we look forward in sort of what we're going to spend rather than looking behind us and not, you know, conveniently maybe not uh, counting some of the things that we didn't expect. So. Um, I would love to see the government take the steps and looking and developing a climate budget so that we say these are the emissions and everything's going to go through a climate lens. And then when we have these shocking experience of forest fires and we look at what the emissions are of that, that perhaps we can actually look at, okay, we got to cut back in other ways next year, just like you would in your spending. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Any other questions? Thanks very much, Catherine. Um, just on Lauren's point, talking about that, and I'm thinking about in writings like Lauren and myself and Greg's where we've been impacted by these huge fires. Um, I guess the question really is, is um, you know, have we, we may need to do some things to mitigate forest fires around communities, which involves doing things like even though you try to extract all the fiber from, you know, it's not always possible. Would you be opposed to the idea that if we had to do some burning or whatever to 
prevent communities from the disaster that we've had this year? Is that something that we can look at with an open mind towards the idea that we're trying to reduce that? Absolutely. I own a rural property myself, and I did fire protection by um, cleaning up some of the tree and the right. debris. And I think that's absolutely critical in terms of forest fires. So that's that's on an adaptation approach. And I, I want to encourage you to continue to adapt, mm -hmm. but we absolutely need to do mitigation as well, still. Mitigation is important. So adaptation and mitigation are key. Okay. Thank you. Shagrip. I think uh, <clears throat> Catherine deserves probably more questions. <laughs> We, uh, we have seen other presentations as well about this. As, as I said earlier, this is a, a very important public policy issue, and it's a complex uh, issue to deal with uh, from a pragmatic point of view. I appreciate your perspective. Um, uh, you know, Ideally, if you think about the best approach will be to shut down everything that creates greenhouse emissions. Uh, <coughs> So that will shut down every car, every bus, every factory, everything, but that is not possible. For sure. So having said that, like we have a Clean BC uh, policy here. Uh, I would like to hear from you. I, you did give good ideas moving forward, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, framing the budget and all that. But is there any specific thing you see happening in other jurisdiction here in or in North America or even in Europe somewhere that you think we should really think about and consider? Oh, I have a gazillion ideas. Um, Give us a few. Not, not <laughs> <laughs> well, I focused just on transportation in yeah. this presentation, but I mean, there's things that can be done in agriculture, for example. So, um, in in and sort of promoting no-till agriculture, so that we don't release the carbon from the soil, and um, so that we keep it captured in the soil, but we also um, do create more green space with certain types of agriculture, so it's not monoculture, it's you know a variety of different crops that you would have on a farm, and that would help to absorb more CO2 emissions. So that would be one small thing. Uh, I mean, housing is another thing, so that if you mandate municipalities through municipal affairs to do more and in, in take that burden away from them in terms of their, uh, they have these big concerns about how do we, uh, with, you know, everybody's complaining they don't want it in their backyard, all this densification of housing. But densification in housing, there's tons of research that talks about how that helps to reduce CO2 emissions. So you can spread it throughout. And, and yes, it's going to be uh, challenging and it's going to be difficult and you can't shut down everything that we're doing. But we have to make some big critical steps in the directions um, that are needed. There's the ideas are plentiful, and I think that you have some incredible staff working for the province of BC that have great ideas, and somehow encouraging and accessing their knowledge and is going to be your success. And I'll just yeah. also say that reduced emission targets are not just political promises, but obligations under the uh, Climate Change Accountability Act and the Carbon Neutral Government Regulation. So it's your obligation. Thank you, Catherine. And we are over time, uh, so we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. And I want to um, thank you for uh, reminding us that we actually do know how to mobilize the public uh, to work together uh, in an in an emergency. We have actually quite recent experience in doing that, <laughs> and uh, the comparisons that you make um, are are very important. Thank so you. thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for hearing Thanks. me. And our next presenter is uh, uh, David Boudinot, uh, Surf Rider Foundation Canada. Uh, David, you have five minutes. Uh, we have um, uh, a lighting system. When it turns green, it means you have two minutes left. We'll let you know when you have 30 seconds left so that you can wrap it up. And the light turns red when your five minutes is up. Thank you. My name is David Boudinot, and I'm the president of Surfrider Foundation Canada. 
an organization dedicated to the protection and enjoyment of the ocean, beaches, and waves through a network of volunteers passionate about the marine environment. I want you to imagine the last time you were at uh, a beach in British Columbia, watching the waves flicker in the golden sunlight. The coastal areas of this province look pristine and spectacular. Now I want you to switch for a moment and imagine the last time you were at a landfill. And if you've never been to a landfill before, I encourage all of you to go see where your uh, trash goes. Now, think of all the refuse piling up at the landfill, generation after generation. Now merge those two images together in your mind, the beach and the landfill, and this is what we're seeing on the coastline of our province. It is going to take funding, leadership, and policy improvements to protect the waters and extensive coastline of this province. Just this summer, over 400 tons of trash was removed from the remote beaches on the coast thanks to the Clean Coast, Clean Waters Project funded by the province and coordinated by the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. A staggering amount of debris, including polystyrene foam, plastic bottles, nets, rope, abandoned boats, and tires was removed from hundreds of kilometers of coastline. Clean Coast, Clean Water supports indigenous communities, coastal tourism operators, and partner environmental organizations, and demonstrates we can all work together to protect the health of our coasts. By continuing to fund cleanups on the coast, the province demonstrates a commitment to community and a healthy environment. Clean Coast, Clean Waters will wrap up in December, and since last summer, 2022, or 2020, the project is on track to removing over 500 tons of debris from the coastline. We applaud the Government of British Columbia and the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy for funding the Clean Coast, Clean Waters project this year and last. Surfrider Foundation volunteers have been documenting an ever-increasing amount of trash, mostly plastic, as small as a lentil and as big as a boat, accumulating on the shores of British Columbia month after month and year after year. We have a crisis on the coast. And if we collectively ignore the problem now, future generations will be bur burdened by plastic trash which persists in the environment. But cleanups alone won't solve the plastic pollution issue. We must look to the source and start implementing common sense solutions to halt the flow of plastics and other pollutants into the waters of British Columbia. The debris Surfrider and other organizations find on the beach tells us a story about industrial pollution going unchecked fishing and aquaculture industries in need of solutions for when gear is lost at sea or end of life. And the flow of plastic entering the waters of British Columbia from uh, pop the flow of plastic is entering the waters from populated areas, the single use plastic items and such. We can keep throwing funding at beach cleanups, which are important and do have a place. But if we wanna get ahead of this issue, we must focus on solutions on the land. So what do we need in addition to funding coastal cleanups? I have three asks. One, our landfills are getting to the point now where end of life discussions are occurring. Through partnerships with organizations like the o Ocean Legacy Foundation, we must enhance and develop a more robust plastic recycling system. Right now, only 9% of plastic is recycled in Canada. Surfrider supports improving extended producer responsibility systems and it's time to shift the focus away from consumer recycling and improve industrial recycling. Given fishing and aquaculture plastics are in the majority of the types of plastics we find on the beaches, a marine industry extended producer responsibility system would make an immediate impact. Number two, the province needs to improve funding for environmental monitoring, regulation, and enforcement as it pertains to plastics. Plastic manufacturing facilities up and down the Fraser River have been spilling plastic pellets at their facilities for years, which wash down storm drains every time it rains. And environmental enforcement has been scant. Requirements to make uh, sure storm drain covers are properly installed at these facilities would reduce plastic pellet pollution, which is accumulating on our coasts and impacting marine life. Third ask, so you, I'm sure you've heard about the three R's. The three R's are reduce, reuse, and recycle. We're pretty good uh, as far as things go on the recycling front, but we really need to focus some funding on the first two R's, reduce and reuse. 
So for reuse, uh, the province has an opportunity to expand systems to encourage reuse of materials. Let's learn from the successes of the bottle uh, reuse systems for beer and milk and expand it out to other single-use products. For reduce, this answer is simple. Let's reduce the plastic use in the province. The health of our coasts is at stake. Thank you for considering funding for coastal cleanups, improving pollution enforcement measures, and creating systems which will lessen the amount of plastic polluting our province, and finding solutions to keep the plastic already here out of the waters and off of the beautiful beaches of British Columbia. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, I'll now entertain uh, questions uh, from the committee. Mike. 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 Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, David. Um, I had the privilege three weeks ago of being in uh, Cox Beach in Tofino. And uh, I, I can honestly say there wasn't one scrap of plastic that washed up the four days I was there. So whether or not it was just the storm weather wasn't there, or whatever the case may be. But uh, my question to you is, uh, you, you know, we, we've seen all the pictures. Uh, we're seeing them on a regular basis, and, and, and the, the three R's are definitely there. I mean, we, we just need to get down, down pat the reduce and reuse. But do you have uh, any stats in your presentation that show where our beaches were 20 years ago, where our beaches are today, and where our beaches, beaches can be 20 years from now? Yeah, we have been monitoring uh, the pollution on the coast over the last few decades, uh, absolutely. Um, I don't have specific numbers. It depends on each beach. Um, but it is uh, worthwhile to note that the plastic production in Canada is, has, in that 20 years, is exponential. The amount of plastic being produced and used is through the roof compared to 20 years ago. And um, with this comes a lot of pollution. And I'm happy to hear that, that you didn't find any uh, trash on the beach at Cox Bay. That's a very well-loved beach. The community there does a great job, uh, including the Surf Rider Foundation chapter there, of making sure those beaches are cleaned up. Uh, but the further up the coast you get, uh, into the harder to get areas, the remote areas, uh, we're finding uh, beaches just devastated in the polystyrene foam pellets and big chunks of plastic and uh, nets and uh, buoys and that kind of thing that uh, should not be in that environment. Okay. No, thank you for your good work. Yeah, but I can forward uh, certainly some stats t uh, to the committee. Perfect. Uh, for the submission deadline. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Ben. Um, thanks, David. I just. Uh, you know, I mean, I commend the work that you're doing, but obviously realizing that that's only the surface and, you know, to get down below that. Having been in an industry that uh, had to adapt to, um, you know, fees that were levied on, we use glass in our particular business and things like that. But I think that, and also part of a government that uh, brought in more uh, heavy um, um, the idea of recycling electronics and things that people didn't think that they could do, and it's so easy. And I think that that's part of the thing. There, <clears throat> anyways, I know that uh, we still continue to pay a fee for the administration of that, but I think that, um, you know, these other areas that you mentioned, the plastics, the stuff that, you know, I mean, I, I do see it when I get out on the ocean, etc. Uh, some of the things that shouldn't be there and I do think that it you got to find a solution that's going to work that's going to make people like I don't know about fishing nets in the sense I'm sure they don't really intend on trying to lose them but no, how do you yeah, I, yeah. anyways I do I do think you need to keep working on that come forward with solutions I'm sure the government's very amenable to looking at things that they can put into that system absolutely and there are some impressive things happening in the plastic recycling front uh, with Ocean Legacy Foundation, Foundation uh, opening up uh, plastic recycling stations. Uh, there's one in Tofino Uclule. Uh, there's another It's just opened up um, on the Fraser River that is accepting uh, aquaculture and fishing uh, nets uh, mm -hmm. for recycling. And mm -hmm. um, they're keeping that out of the landfills. And yeah, um, yeah. Um, and you know, British Columbia can be a leader. There are many jurisdictions that mm -hmm. uh, are at play here. Mm -hmm. You know, we're one of many. We can uh, set a very good example for a coastal community, and um, enact policies which are fair and equitable, um, which will 
ultimately prevent plastic from getting back in the water. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, we'll wrap it up at this point, David. Uh, thank you um, so much for your presentation and for framing it in the context of uh, a crisis on the coast and that it isn't just all about cleanup, that we also have to take action that addresses the source of this particular crisis. So thank you yeah. very much. Appreciate the time. Thank you. And our next and uh, final presentation for the day is Zita uh, Botillo, uh, Watersheds BC. So Zita, you have uh, five minutes. Uh, we have a, a um, light system. Uh, so the light changes green when you have two minutes left. We'll give you a signal when you have 30 seconds left so that you know to start wrapping it up. And the light turns red when you're out of your five minutes. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and select standing committee members. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Zita Batello and I am the Director of Watersheds BC and the Co-Director of the Healthy Watersheds Initiative. I respectfully acknowledge that today we're on the unceded territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, which include the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. These two First Nations and others across the province are central to the issue of watershed security, which is what I'm gonna to speak to you about today. Like many Canadians, freshwater lakes, streams, and creeks play a really important part in my life and in my life experience. I spent my early childhood years in Northern Ontario, canoeing, fishing, swimming, and playing in the lakes during the summer, and then skiing and snowshoeing and ice fishing on them in the winter. I moved to BC in my early 20s and experiencing the forests, oceans, and the mighty rivers changed my life path. I've worked for over 22 years in, environment, in the environmental sector and more, ha more than half of that time in the public sector and directly working on freshwater management, conservation, and governance. At Watersheds BC, I work with my team to develop capacity for local watershed governance and security, which includes providing training, resources, and peer-to-peer -peer learning for local governments, First Nations, watershed organizations, and stewardship groups. Today I'm speaking specifically to you about the Healthy Watersheds Initiative. Watersheds BC is working in partnership with the Real Estate Foundation. As many of you know, the Real Estate Foundation is a philanthropic organization that works to advance sustainable land use in BC. And through their grant making, research and partnerships, they've demonstrated a lasting commitment to freshwater sustainability, watershed governance and community led conservation. The Real Estate Foundation will be submitting um, a written submission to the committee. At this time last year, this government developed an economic response to the pandemic and it put people and communities first and the Healthy Watersheds Initiative was part of that investment. It was a $27 million investment to be spent across 61 community driven water restoration and conservation projects across the province. In the words of your colleague, Honorable um, Minister Heyman, he stated that it has been a success beyond his wildest dreams. In just eight months, the HWI has demonstrated that investing in watersheds is a triple win that creates jobs, boosts local economy, and protects drinking water and critical salmon habitat, along with strengthening relationships with First Nations and Indigenous partners. These projects are helping to advance many of the government's priorities. And I'm here today to ask this committee to consider our recommendation of $50 million, so $25 million over two years in bridge funding to extend the Healthy Watersheds Initiative for two more years until the government finalizes the development of a watershed security fund in 2023. Here are some of the reasons why that's a smart investment. HWI is supporting jobs, training, and local economies. Project proponents have supported 697 jobs and counting in trained workers and indigenous and Western techniques for fish and water sampling, water monitoring, field safety, land management, and more. They're good jobs that provide paid employment and experience to young workers and recent graduates, many, many of them in the demographic group most impacted by COVID-19. Because watershed work is place-based by nature, these dollars invested in communities stay in communities and projects have leveraged their funding to an increased $10 million. 
HWI supporting reconciliation in relationships and UNDRIP. Healthy watersheds and ecosystems are critical to the exercise of Indigenous rights to hunting, fishing, gathering, ceremony, and land stewardship. Recognizing that HWI was designed to support the implementation of UNDRIP and DRIPA, nearly a third of our projects are led by Indigenous organizations or governments, and three quarters of them are confirming or strengthening relationships with the First Nation. We're also supporting ecosystem restoration, salmon habitat, and climate action. These projects are um, reducing flood risk, buffering communities from droughts and wildfires, and providing uh, new habitat for salmon, fish, and other species. The challenge is the clock is ticking. The money needs to be spent by December 31st. And to keep this momentum going and the watershed work happening beyond December, we need additional funding in order to support your government uh, to continue these investments in prosperous communities, healthier people, communities, restored salmon runs, and enduring partnerships with First Nations. This is an important bridge to a water security fund. And I know that my colleagues have spoken to you about that ask, um, but the HWI is an important bridge to being, for your government to be able to achieve that objective. Thank you. Thank you, Zita. Um, questions for our guest? It's the end of the day. <laughs> ben. Thanks, Zita. Um, I think we all want good water and we want to achieve those things that you talked about. Tell me about these projects that you're, you're doing. Like, can you give us an example of, of the 60 projects you're doing? Give us a couple of examples of where this money is going into, besides the people that are working there. What's, what? Oh, I'd love to. Well, um, give, me, give me one example then. Well, I'll give you one um, that I um, recently was at the site with your <coughs> colleague, um, Minister Leonard, uh, which is called the Kukusum Paving Paradise. And the project is restoring an old sawmill site and restoring it back to its normal state. It's over eight hectares of land. Uh, the premier supported the acquisition of some of that land. The community raised a lot of, of the money to acquire the land. Um, it was a partnership that the local stewardship group worked with, um, worked with the forestry company that used to own the land, and then the community worked to fundraise, and then the, the government was uh, catalyzed uh, the last little bit of funding. And then this funding has in turn supported the work to start on the ground. So there's excav excavation of, of t thousands of tons of, of asphalt and concrete um, that have to come out before the planting can happen um, and the restoration of the stream that is beside um, the site. And of course, it's a critical area for salmon habitat. And we were able to see uh, salmon in the stream when I was just there recently. So there are people, it's employing a variety of types of people. So the, all the, the kind of hard machinery, heavy machinery folks, the restoration teams, the biologists. Um, so that's one example. Um, there's another uh, project that's happening in the Pitt Lake region where there is, it's a really, it's a focused um, habitat restoration site where they're working the world Wildlife Federation is working with the Katsi Nation and the local government to do a bunch of restoration work to open up some stream channels. They're doing removing invasives, planting plants, um, to a project that's happening on the Sunshine Coast where they're working on a watershed management plan and watershed governance for the region. As many of you probably have heard or read the headlines over the years, it's a region that is consistently challenged by water shortages. Um, and they are working on a planning process to try to avoid that in the future. That's a, just a, I could go on and on, but those are a few examples mm -hmm. of the work. Thank you. Lauren. Thank you, Chair. Um, just curious, how do people go about accessing these funds? I mean, do they apply to you? That's a great question. Uh, this was a very anomalous situation where when... Um, COVID hit, there have been a number of groups in the watershed community that have worked together closely for quite a long time. And we anticipated that there would be a need for, or likely some stimulus funding. And so we immediately mobilized to 
send a survey out through our networks and networks of networks to get a um, sample of shovel-ready projects that could be um, implemented through some stimulus funding. And so we collected um, 144 project proposals. Um, that were over two, $200 million worth of projects, and we shared that with the province as part of the, um, when ministries were looking for um, opportunities for stimulus funding. And so we worked with the province. They took that list and went through a, um, a technical review and sort of prioritized what was feasible in the time frame. And those were the projects that were funded. So there are many more that weren't. Um, that were on that list. And then there are many, of course, that weren't part of that list um, and that are eager to have an opportunity to do the same kind of work in their communities. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing other questions. Uh, so Zita, I'd like to thank you on behalf uh, of the committee and to thank you for your leadership in this area. I think we probably all know intuitively how um, important watersheds are uh, and also how they've been damaged. Uh, it's really important as well that you've um, been very uh, clear and specific about the other benefits of this work. Great, thank so, you so much. You. I also, I do have a summary sheet here with a QR code if any of you want to. We have an interim report. It will also be submitted as part of the formal documentation, but I also have this here if you want to do a quick scan and you can see what our interim report is showing in terms of our, our results. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, thank everybody. You. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. All those in favor? The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>